into this workshop. Thanks very much for coming. So we have a great lineup of uh, speakers this afternoon, um, and we'll start with Anna Hutchinson. So Anna is a PhD student um, at the MRC Biostatistics Unit, University of Cambridge, and her broad research interest is in developing statistical uh, methods to better understand the genetic basis of complex diseases. And today she will be talking about the use of conditional pulse discovery rates in high dimensional association testing. Uh, so Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. I'll just share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Excellent. So yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, David. Um, my name's Anna and I'm just finishing my PhD at the MRC Biostatistics Unit in Cambridge. And today I'll be giving a talk entitled Leveraging Auxiliary Data in High Dimensional Association Testing Using Conditional False Discovery Rates. So as I'm the first talk of the day, I thought I'd quickly recap the multiple testing problem using an example from genetics, which is relevant for this talk. So genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, are a key tool in statistical genetics, and they aim to identify mutations in the DNA, which I'm going to call genetic variants, which associate with a trait, for example, height or disease status. The output from a GWAS are p-values against the null hypothesis of no association between a genetic variant and the trait of interest. And the results are typically visualized in this type of plot, which is called a Manhattan plot. So each point represents a genetic variant. On the x-axis, we have the genomic position of the, gen the genetic variant. And on the y-axis, we have the negative log 10 p-value from GWAS. So the higher up on this plot, the more evidence there is of an association between that genetic variant and the trait of interest. However, each genetic variant is tested one at a time. And a GWAS can contain up to millions of genetic variants, which corresponds to millions of statistical tests, and quite a severe multiple testing problem. So if we were to use the classic alpha equals 0.05 p-value threshold to call significant results, then we'd get an awful lot of false positives. Instead, the GWAS community have decided on a more stringent p-value threshold of 5 times 10 to the negative 8 to call significant results. And this value was selected using the Bonferroni correction on the estimated effective number of independent tests performed if all independent genetic variants were tested in the genome. So the Bonferroni correction, you just divide your um, alpha level by the number of independent tests which you're performing, which is estimated to be about 1 million in GWAS. And that's how we derive this 5 times 10 to the negative 8, very stringent genome-wide significance threshold. Ooh. So, like I said, this is based on the Bonferroni correction, um, but the Bonferroni correction is known to be very stringent because it controls the family-wise error rate, which is the probability of at least one false positive. And so GWAS results are generally limited because we don't quite have the statistical power that's required to find these associations that exceed this very significant, this very stringent significance threshold. So we actually have access to lots and lots of biological data relating to each genetic variant. So for example, suppose that this genetic variant here resides in a region of the genome which is really inaccessible and not likely to be involved in disease pathways. Whereas these two genetic variants here reside in really highly active regions of the genome which we think are involved in um, disease pathways then we may choose to prioritize these variants that are in green rather than the one in red. And that is we might be able to use this external biological information to increase the power to detect these genetic variants in green. So the aim of this research was to develop a statistical method that leverages this sort of external biological data with GWAS test statistics to increase the sensitivity whilst controlling some error rate, such as the false discovery rate. So let's quickly recap the false discovery rate, or the FDR. So it was first introduced by Benjamini and Hochberg, um, and they introduced the frequentist interpretation, which is the expected fraction of false discoveries amongst all discoveries. Efron then extended this to a Bayesian interpretation, which is the probability that the null hypothesis is true for a random test in a set of tests with p less than some p-value. 
And this paper that I've cited here by Wen um, sort of describes the differences between these interpretations. Um, it's definitely worth a read. And he states that they're actually asymptotically equivalent. So let's consider the Bayesian FDR for a second. So the Bayesian FDR is the probability that the null hypothesis is true, given that our p-value is below some value. So I like to think of this as given that we're in the sort of rejection region of very small p-values where we'd normally reject the null hypothesis, what is the probability that the null hypothesis is actually true, i.e. that we've made a false discovery? So we can use Bayes' theorem to expand this into these terms here. And we know that p-values are uniformly distributed under the null hypothesis, which means that we can approximate this first term here by p. In the GWAS setting, which I'll go on to describe, the probability of an association is very rare. So we can approximate the probability that the null is true by one. And this basically just gives us a conservative estimate of the FDR. And then for the denominator here, we can actually just count up our p-values that are less than this, this value p. So the conditional false discovery rate is an extension to the FDR when we have two sets of p-values. So we have p-values, our principal p-values, and we also have our auxiliary p-values. So the CFDR is then the probability of the null hypothesis for our principal p-values, given that our principal and our auxiliary p-values are less than some thresholds. So the idea behind, and the idea is that your auxiliary p-values typically tell you something about the principal p-values. So here I've plotted on the x-axis the negative log 10 principal p-values, and on the y-axis I plotted the negative log 10 auxiliary p-values. So if we were just to ignore our auxiliary data, then we typically just select some threshold on P and call anything stronger than this um, as significantly associated, say, in GWAS. But the CFDR approach allows us to alter this threshold such that it adapts to the joint distribution of P and Q. So that is, if we have really, really strong evidence coming from our auxiliary P value, then we may require less strong evidence at that genetic variance, say, um, in our principal p-value. And that's sort of what we see here. So the conditional false discovery rate was first introduced in the GWAS literature by Andreas and colleagues. And it's ultimately used to leverage GWAS results from related traits to boost power to discover more associations. So in this first paper here, they leveraged um, GWAS results for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which are known to be genetically related traits, in order to increase power to detect new associations. And this approach is really, really common in the literature. There's papers coming out all the time which utilize this approach. However, James Liley, who is a former colleague, found that these conventional CFDR methods do not actually control the false discovery rate. So he developed an extension um, which was published earlier this year um, to the CFDR approach, which can be used to actually control the false discovery rate. So as usual, it takes in some p-values for a principal trait, p, and some p-values for an auxiliary trait, q. And this method outputs something called a v-value. Now, a v-value, I'll go into more detail of what this is later, but it can be interpreted as an adjusted p-value based on this auxiliary information. And therefore, it can be used in any error rate controlling procedures, such as the benjamini hoberg method, to derive um, FDR-controlled quantities. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the CFDR approaches typically leverage um, auxiliary p-values. However, we've seen that we have access to lots and lots of biological information, which may also tell us something about our principal trait. And these biological data tend to come from arbitrary distributions. So our contribution was to extend this statistically robust framework so that it can be used to leverage sort of any data from arbitrary distributions that you may like. Um, and in our purpose, that tends to be functional genomic data, um, looking at the activity and the biology of these genetic variants. And our approach is called flexible CFDR. So I'll just go into a bit more detail of the method behind flexible CFDR. So here I've just written out um, what the CFDR is. I've then just used Bayes' theorem to expand this. And I've used Bayes' theorem again uh, for this term here and then just standard conditional probability rules for the denominator. 
we get the cancellation of some terms and a key assumption of the CFDR approach is that P and Q are auxiliary and are principal and P values are uh, conditionally independent given the null hypothesis for the principal trait. And that just allows us to approximate this first term here by P, which is quite nice. So this is the standard CFDR estimator, which is used in all of the CFDR papers, um, which I showed on an earlier slide. But the contribution of our method is that we actually use kernel density estimation to estimate these probabilities, whereas the earlier methods use empirical CDFs. We found that these empirical CDFs weren't that accurate at modeling um, this, this um, data that's from arbitrary distributions. For example, empirical CDFs make very weak modeling assumptions between data points. So in regions of sparse data, um, they may not be accurately modeling our auxiliary data. And we found that uh, KDEs were better able to model these more flexible distributions. So once we've derived our CFDR values for each PQ pair, we then associate each of these with its smallest rejection region, and this is called an L region. And this procedure is described in a lot more detail in James Liley's paper from earlier this year. And we then derive a V value. So a V value is the probability that a random PQ pair would fall in this L region, given the null hypothesis. And that can be derived by integrating the joint null PDF over the L region. So basically, all you need to remember is that these V values are the probability of observing as extreme or more extreme CFDR value given the null, which is very similar to the definition of a P value. I mean that these V values are actually analogous to P values, and there's lots of proofs in this paper to show that. So because these V values are analogous to P values, they can be used in any error rate controlling procedure, such as the Benjamini Hopberg method. And they also allow for iteration. So I won't go into detail, but if you have multiple auxiliary um, data sets that you'd like to leverage, then you can just use the V value from the earlier iteration as the principal trait P value and just iterate through your functional data sets like that. So we use simulations to assess the accuracy of our approach. And we first looked at leveraging independent auxiliary data. So we're basically throwing information that is not relevant in any way. So we'd hope that the conclusions of our study don't change. And that's what we identified. Sensitivity and specificity and FDR remain stable. And we iterated over this data using flexible CFDR. And BL here is just a comparator method called Boker and Leach FDR regression, um, which we found didn't control the FDR, even when leveraging these independent data sets. We then looked at leveraging dependent data sets. So now this auxiliary data is telling us something about our principal trait. And we found that the sensitivity increased as we iterated over this auxiliary data um, and the specificity and the FDR remained constant. So this was really nice to see because it shows that the flexible CFDR method is increasing the sensitivity, which means that we're identifying more true things, um, which is not the expense of identity not at the expense of identifying more false things. So that was very nice to see. So I'll just finish with an application. So here we took GWAS results um, for asthma, which are shown here and in this paper. And we wish to leverage auxiliary information looking at the activity of each genetic variant. So basically, this is quantified by something called a H3K27 acylation count. And basically the higher these counts, the higher these values, the more evidence there is that that genetic variant resides in a region of the genome, which is very highly active and potentially likely to be involved in disease pathways. So we use flexible CFDR to leverage this external biological information with these published GUS statistics to derive our V values. And these are our results. So the original GWAS identified 18 uh, genomic regions which associated with asthma. When using flexible CFDR to leverage this external biological information, we were able to identify four new genetic regions shown in green, which became newly FDR significant by our approach. And this zoomed in panel here is just of this region to show that they are three independent signals. And similarly, we found one region which became newly not significant after applying flexible CFDR here in red. So due to time, I'll just explain this association here. So this was a region which became newly significant after leveraging this external data. 
So the external data, when we went back to look at it, um, showed that this genetic variant was really, really likely to be active um, it, in the asthma relevant cell types that we looked at. It also resides in the SAT6 gene, which is known to play a role in the immune response. And also we found that it had previously been associated with an increased risk of dermatitis. And it's known that dermatitis often progresses um, to asthma in adulthood. So this means that potentially we found a genetic variant which underlies some biological mechanism involved in both dermatitis and asthma. And the way that we validate these results is we go back to the literature and we find GWAS which have been performed on larger sample sizes as these have more power to detect these associations. So we did this with the UK Biobank, which was for data, I think for 40,000 cases and 300,000 controls. And we found that the p-value from this larger GWAS um, was very, very significant for this genetic variant. And this just provides evidence that our approach is identifying um, true positive results. So in summary, we have developed a statistically robust framework used to prioritize new GWAS associations by leveraging external data, and it's called Flexible CFDR. Our preprint is available on BioArchive, and we also have a web page which contains like fully reproducible vignettes, step-by-step um, -step installation instructions and things like that. So I'd like to acknowledge Chris Wallace, who's my PhD supervisor, James Liley, who conceived the idea of these V-values, and Guillermo and Tom, who have contributed to the flexible CFDR manuscript. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions now or via email. Great, thank you very much, Anna, for a very nice and clear talk. Uh, so I'd encourage anyone who has questions to put them in the Q&A, um, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so we already have a couple of questions. Uh, so firstly from Emel, uh, who asks, how often is the GWAS database uh, updated and how would this impact uh, the threshold of 10 to the minus eight? So the threshold of five times 10 to the negative eight is conventional. That's what's been used in years in the GWAS literature. People have talked about changing it because like I said, family-wise error is very stringent. Why aren't we using something like FDR? But the GWAS community tend to be perhaps quite stubborn um, and they're just used to it and they don't want to change it. So GWAS databases are updated all the time. GWAS are coming out every day, um, but that doesn't affect the um, threshold. And I assume that you're relating to the Bonferroni correction where we divided by a million. The million will stay the same no matter how many data sets there are, because that's looking at the number of independent genetic variants in the genome. And that doesn't change as more studies come out. We know that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have a question from uh, Jacob. You are, how, how sensitive is your approach to the bandwidth choice when using the KDEs? Yeah, that's a great question and something that we've been back and forth with reviewers about. So obviously our method is dependent on how accurate the KDE is at modeling the auxiliary data. Um, we, we've applied it to lots of data sets and we haven't found any examples where it's not accurate. At the moment we use um, a default bandwidth estimation. Um, there are options in the software if users want to change that then they can. But one way to get around this is that by default, when you use our software, it outputs a plot, which will show you how the KDE fits to your data. So if from that you see that it's not fitting very well, um, then you may go back at the function and see if you can alter the bandwidth or it, we use Gaussian kernels, perhaps a different kernel would be, would be better for that approach. Um, because obviously a Gaussian kernel isn't gonna be perfect for all data types. Yes, thanks, Anna, for answering for a brilliant presentation. Thank you. So we also have a question from Sophia, who says, very nice talk, Hannah. I wonder how many times larger is the validation sample from Biobank to the one you used to find the original result with the new methods that you have just presented? Yeah, so if I've interpreted the question right, um, the, the asthma GWAS data set that we used was, I've got it written here, was 20,000 cases and 100,000 controls whereas the validation was approximately double that. Um, and that was the largest that we can find. And it's nice because we have these validation data sets so we can check if we are finding the right things, basically. Great. 
And one final question from me. So your, your method is flexible because it can be used to leverage a variety of auxiliary data types. Are there any data types that your method wouldn't be able to leverage? Yeah, that's a good question too. So again, it relates back to the KDE. So the accuracy depends on how well that's modeling um, the data. Um, and again, a nice feature is that it outputs this plot, which you can use. Um, there are obviously some data types which just won't work. So for example, binary data, um, the CFGR approach currently isn't suited for leveraging binary data, such as whether a genetic variant is coding or not. So we're actually developing um, an extension now called binary CFDR, which can be used to leverage these binary data sources. Great, well, that sounds good. So looking forward to seeing. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Anna, very much. So our next speaker is Ziyu Zhu, who is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, his current research focuses on multiple hypothesis testing problems, as well as robust machine learning. And his talk today will be on dynamic algorithms for online multiple testing. Uh, so Ziyu, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Cool. Um, thanks for the introduction, David. Uh, I guess I'll share my screen. All right, cool. Cool. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Ziyu, or I go by Neil, and I'm going to be talking about my joint work on um, dynamic algorithms for online multiple testing uh, with Aditya Rambis. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little about this problem of what online multiple testing is. So it goes back to, of course, to testing many different hypotheses. Um, so we could imagine maybe we're a tech company and we have a website and we have some hypotheses about which features we can change that can change the user engagement on our website. Um, maybe we could change the color of our website. That's one hypothesis. Maybe we could change the number of icons. Um, maybe we could change the style. But fundamentally, our goal is to reject only non-null hypotheses, which in this case are you know, features that we add that actually make a positive effect on the user engagement uh, of our website, otherwise known as uh, making true discoveries. This is kind of analogous to the scientific uh, process of experimentation, where we want to uh, make discoveries about the world where you know, the null hypothesis is not true um, and we learn something new. So how we formally set up this online multiple testing problem is that um, at each time step, because it's online, so we kind of think of um, getting a sequence of hypotheses. We get hypotheses and we get a corresponding p-value from an experiment that tests that hypothesis. And our algorithm, so our algorithm for doing this multiple testing is going to output some alpha value. And in this case, we reject this first hypothesis only if the corresponding p-value uh, is less than the alpha value output by our algorithm. Um, and then we just kind of do this in on this infinite series. So that's kind of the online nature of the problem where we're getting this oncoming stream. And every time we get a p-value from a new experiment, we have to, or before, right before we do that, we have to output some threshold and reject that hypothesis before we get the next p-value. So the assumptions on p-values that we make is that um, the p-value is super uniform. So basically a little, uh, you can just think of it as being uniform if the hypothesis is null. And otherwise, you know, the p-value could be potentially small if the hypothesis is not null, if we have a high power test, but we don't make any assumptions specifically about the behavior of p-values when the hypothesis is not null. So the idea is that, you know, we want to make as many uh, true discoveries as possible, but we also want to kind of control the number of times we reject a null hypothesis or make a false discovery. So we're going to talk a little bit about error metrics that people have considered controlling in the past in this online multiple testing problem, uh, multiple testing problem, and also kind of what we're trying to control in our algorithm. So they all revolve around the false discovery proportion, and this is indexed at time k because we're getting hypotheses indexed uh, by this time, which is just the number of false discoveries divided by the number of total discoveries at time k. Um, 
And then we also have a, kind of a different notion of FDR or false discovery rate. And this is the error metric that has primarily been looked at in prior work. So we still look at the expectation of the false discovery proportion, but we essentially want to, because you know, there's it's a sequential problem, we want to control it at all fixed times. So we take we control kind of the soup over all of K in the naturals. So instead, what we look at um, is kind of a different bound, is a probabilistic bound on the FDP. So this is called the false discovery exceedance or shorten it to FDX. And the first thing to note about this metric is that it's a time uniform bound. So essentially we want to bound the probability that the false discovery proportion exceeds some threshold epsilon um, at any time K past a certain specific large time, large K. Um, and it turns out that controlling this FDX actually allows us to control an augmented version of the FDR where we're extending kind of the soup to not just all finite uh, fixed times, but the set of stopping times. So we can imagine like one such stopping time is the time where we make the fifth rejection because um, that is data dependent and based on what rejections we've made in the past. And that is based on kind of the p-values uh, that, that are output in the experiments. So our algorithm is interested in controlling this FDX and this augmented form of the FDR. So to talk a little bit about the high level of how our algorithm kind of outputs alpha values such that we can do this is we kind of think in terms of something called alpha investing where our algorithm maintains this abstract notion called wealth. So essentially every time we output an alpha value we lose some wealth proportionate to the alpha value. Um, but also when we you know, make a rejection um, we actually gain wealth back. And this, this is the way we kind of try to control how, uh, how large our alpha values are. Um, so the idea here is that the reason we have something like wealth is because we ultimately show some kind of relationship between having non-zero wealth is the same as maintaining FDR or FDX, um, depending on the kind of method you want to use. And at the same time, we want our algorithm to have high power, which is defined as the number of true discoveries divided by it the number of non-null hypotheses. So the total number of yeah, uh, non-null hypotheses that could possibly be discovered. So our goal is essentially to keep um, either FDX uh, controlled at a fixed level or FDR controlled at a fixed level and also have high power. So the contributions of our paper is to have the first practically powerful algorithm with FDX control. Um, there has been an algorithm in the past with FDX control, but we show that it does not really make very many rejections in our simulations. And you know, our algorithm does actually make many rejections. And secondly, kind of orthogonal to this first point, we kind of discovered this new dynamic way of allocating alpha values um, that basically utilizes some power that's left on the table uh, by previous methods. And lastly, our method for FDX control is also the first method that provides FDR control at stopping times. Um, but this is, uh, and this is kind of a almost a re direct result from controlling this FDX value, um, but we'll leave that point to the paper and we'll mostly discuss these first two points in the talk. So to kind of motivate how we control the FDX, first we'll look um, at kind of what prior work has done to control this fixed time FDR. And this is done by an algorithm called Lord. So what they do is take kind of this estimator view of the FDP. So I'm just going to rewrite the FDP here in this slightly different notation, um, just to emphasize that we're summing kind of something that looks like the alpha values from one to K, um, but it's a little less than that because we only sum it up when um, over the null hypotheses in the numerator. Um, and what we construct essentially is this other estimator FDP hat, which instead of you know, constructing, uh, adding up these indicator variables, we're just adding up the alpha values themselves. What they show for Lord is that essentially that in expectation, um, this FDP is upper bounded by this estimator. So what Lord does essentially is just maintain this estimator to be less than equal to this prefix level of control L at all time steps. And by combining these two facts, 
you get the fact that this algorithm lord controls FDR at level L because at every step K, um, this expected value FDP is bounded by the expected value of FDP hat, which then itself is bounded by L. So we get FDR's control there. Um, so we also kind of take an estimator view of the FTP in our algorithm, which is called suplord. Um, so the first fact we know is that note uh, note is that there's this high probability uh, estimator of the FTP that was in, introduced in Katz, Fitch, and Rambis in 2021. So what the statement says is that you know uh, the probability that the FTP exceeds our, our new estimator FTP bar at any step k uh, is less than or equal to delta. So this is high probability bound on the FTP that's also time uniform. And to give a sense of kind of how this estimator rela uh, relates to wealth, we're gonna first define it here. And we can see it kind of does look like what we saw earlier with FTP hat, but we have this kind of approximately log one of the delta constant in the front. And the idea is that whenever we output an alpha value, since we need to, uh, since our goal is essentially to um, always make sure this estimator is kept under a upper bound, every time we output an alpha value, we're increasing our FTP bar and we're decreasing wealth. And we could almost think of that as decreasing the distance between our estimator and uh, the fixed level of control we want it at. And similarly, if we make a rejection, we're increasing our denominator, which is decreasing our estimator overall. And that's kind of you know, increasing the distance between prefix level of control and our estimator. And we can think of that as increasing wealth. So that kind of, this is trying to motivate that the wealth point of view, um, that's kind of where it comes from, where when we make a rejection, we increase wealth. And when we uh, output an alpha, we spend wealth. So the idea here is that our algorithm, what it does is it makes sure this estimator is controlled under epsilon for all uh, time after you know some uh, startup time, big K. And this is the same thing as ensuring the FDX is controlled uh, to be under delta. So then we now, we're now gonna show some kind of empirical results of suplord we do on simulations. So we do this on p-values from one-sided z-test on ID Gaussians. Um, and we choose some parameters for um, both methods that control FDR on the bottom and that control FDX on the top. Um, so we do this over kind of the settings of where we have different signal strengths and different rates of nominals. And this is kind of the prior best FDX controlling method based on Lord. And it's, you can, it's very weak and it sometimes does not exceed Bonferroni in the settings versus this is our method, which is in a sense, comparable to Lord at the current setting it's chosen, but it's not a direct comparison because there's more parameters to set for FDX versus FDR control. So this shows that our method is uh, empirically powerful and surpasses previous FDX methods. And we also run our algorithm on a real world data set of p-values. Um, so we cannot know the power because we don't know which are the actually non-null hypotheses, but at the very least, our algorithm does make uh, much more rejections than the other uh, methods. Cool. So to talk about the second point, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the wealth of this, wealth of suplord. So this is one definition, uh, one formal definition of wealth of suplord. Um, and essentially what the wealth is, is that here we kind of see on the right inside the maximum, our term is essentially the FTP bar that we've seen uh, before. And we need to keep it constrained under epsilon to uh, maintain FDX control. So the idea behind wealth is essentially how much alpha can I spend without making more rejections such that the wealth, uh, such that the FTP bar is still maintained under epsilon, which is something our algorithm needs to maintain. And we make kind of an empirical observation that our algorithm suplord just naively accumulates a lot of wealth. So essentially um, the estimator that we have and the bound we need to keep it under is actually increasing. The gap between them is increasing. So this is kind of unused wealth, which leads to smaller alpha values and unexploited power. So essentially counterfactually, we maybe could have increased our alpha values a little more and that would give us more power and that would still have made sure the estimator we want to keep under epsilon is under epsilon. 
So our solution is essentially just to use larger alpha values after making this observation. And this is our algorithm dynamic compared to some other baseline algorithms for allocating alpha values. And we see that generally um, our method has larger alpha values over most of the hypotheses. Um, and we can also see here, hopefully, okay. We can see here in the top right graph that you know our wealth for this dynamic method that we propose uh, does no longer has increasing wealth. And the bottom here is a plot of the power of our way of allocating alpha values uh, versus other baseline methods. And we can see also it has the best power. So um, this kind of way of increasing our alpha values does actually increase the power of our algorithm. So I guess the takeaways of this talk are that um, FDX control can be achieved by essentially using a high probability estimator of the FDP and then making sure that is controlled uh, at every time step. And secondly, it's that previous algorithms kind of underutilize wealth by not spending it fast enough. And thus we have this gap between our estimator and the bound we want to keep it under. And we can simply increase power just by using larger alpha values because we can push this estimator a little closer uh, to its upper bound. So cool. Thanks for listening. Uh, be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, ZU, for a really nice talk. Uh, so if people have questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Uh, so while we're waiting for some, I'll, I'll start. So I guess a more, more general question. Um, when thinking about, I guess, FDX and false discovery exceedance control compared with FDR control, mm -hmm. I guess, do, do you have some thoughts around when you might choose either metric and control in different settings? Yeah, I kind of think maybe in the online, I was thinking FDX makes a little more sense, um, just in the sense that because when you're doing FDR, you're kind of taking an expectation over you know, many runs. Um, but maybe if I'm in this online setting, I could be running, like, I guess in the tech company example, I could be just kind of keeping this algorithm running the whole time. And every time, you know, my, the engineers develop a new feature or whatever, I want to keep making sure that this FTP is very controlled. So I guess because you kind of maybe take one trial that's kind of going for a very long time, maybe a high probability bound makes more sense because you can say something a little more strong about that single trial rather than kind of an aggregate metric like FDR is. Yeah, thank you. So Sophia has raised her hand, so I will unmute her and she can ask a question. Awesome. Uh, Sophia, I think. Hello. Hi. Hi, really nice talk. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering um, how much how much of an emphasis of, of efficiency um, uh, it's, it's put in this in developing these these alternative methods for for the online testing. And I was surprised that you're emphasizing on that. And uh, do you think that, that there should be more attention on, on reporting uh, power, for example, and, and looking at that? I see. So your question, I, I'm, I think I understand is like, uh, like there's kind of the directions of accounting for kind of multiple testing correct, correction and also for, you're saying like checking whether non-nulls have enough power um, when you're proposing new hypotheses. Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and you, had a, you had a point in saying that uh, you were going to look at power specifically in one of the slides. So I, 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 I think that's really valuable, but I wonder what's your opinion. Is that is that uh, starting to, to be looked at um, more? Should be should we be looked at more? Um, I guess I'm not sure if I'm answering the right question, but I guess my thoughts is like, this is kind of an orthogonal direction to looking at the power of a specific test. Um, I guess this is just saying like, even, um, I guess maybe the problem with like not having enough power is that when you don't correct for multiple testing corrections and you just have a bunch of very low power tests, like you're going to bound to get, you know, false discoveries. So like just by increasing power, like maybe this is some heuristic way of ensuring that your type one error is controlled. 
Um, but I guess the idea behind here is that, you know, you could have really powerless tests even for the non-nulls or whatever, but, um, you know, this still always ensures that you have this FDR guarantee or FDX guarantee, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Mia. Uh, so we have a question from Thomas. I guess, is this in the chat or is I'm speaking? Um, just asking, asking him to unmute. Um, Okay. Not sure. Okay. Well, let's let's come back to that. Um, there's a question from from Jacobo who asks, uh, "Does subload ensure error control for discrete or dependent p values?" Yeah. So I guess I kind of um, skipped over this a bit in the assumptions on p values, but the assumption here is that it's not quite independent p-values. So it's like, actually you assume the p-values are conditionally uniform essentially on all your past rejections. Um, so they do handle, I think, discrete because all the, it needs to, the, all the p-value needs to do is satisfy that super uniformity property, but um, it does not handle dependent p-values necessarily. Um, so that's something we still have to explore. Or at least it does not handle it under arbitrary dependence. Okay, and final question from Abdullah who asks, how are online hypotheses defined? Um, is there any order in the different hypotheses? Um, yeah, so the idea behind online is that you kind of have, you can just accept any hypotheses and it's also an ongoing stream. So like, it, it's not, Worst case, but like it can handle worst case allocation of, you know, whether it's like nulls or non nulls or your non nulls just are powerless. Um, so there's no assumptions on the order in a sense. Okay. Thank you very much to you uh, for a very nice talk. So we will now go to the final speaker for this session, who is Marie Perot Dockens, who has recently started as assistant professor at the MAP5 Laboratory and SDID Department of the IUT de Paris. Uh, her recent interests include variable selection, multiple testing, and post hoc inference. And today she'll be speaking on post hoc discovery report inference. Uh, so, Marie, the floor is yours. Hi, David. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, so, let me just share my desktop. Okay. So hi everyone, thank you for the invitation. So I'm Marie. So uh, today I will present you a work, which is a joint work with Gilles Blanchard from uh, Université Paris-Saclay, Pierre Nevial from l'Institut Mathématique de Toulouse, and Étienne Roquin from Sorbonne University. And I will talk about post-selection inference for first discovery proportion in Haydn Markov model. I will start by presenting to you the motivation of this work, then quickly introduce the HMM model, and then present to you the different bonds that we propose, and finish by some numerical experiments and an application. So as you, as you all know, uh, from each chromosome, we have two copies. We have one, chromo one chromosome from our father and one chromosome from our, our mother. And um, sometimes, and especially in tumor cells, there is a genetic, pro genetic problem and some piece of the chromosome can be deleted or some piece of the chromosome can be replicated. So from some position, instead of having only two copies, we have three, four, etc., or less, one or even zero copies for some position. And um, the idea of this, of this work uh, used the data from Okamato and HAL 2015. So the idea is to compare patients uh, that have endometriosis and patients that doesn't have endometriosis in the ovarian cancer. So here, for instance, I present you a part of the chromosome 7. So here you have the different position of the chromosome, and here you have the statistics of the test comparing the, position, the number of copies of the patients uh, that have endometriosis and that doesn't have the different position. 
and how the objective was to propose interval on the false discovery proportion. With the selection that can be freely chosen by the user. So for instance, the user can be interested in p-value lower than a given threshold. So this is the point in orange here. Or the user can use more specific uh, way of selecting p-value, of uh, selecting hypotheses. So for instance, here is the, the methodology proposing by 7 pi and 209 that would select the orange point or even other algorithms that are not created for multiple testing at the beginning. Um, our second objective was to propose more informative uh, information than point-wise estimate, FDR estimate, but we wanted a bond on the false discovery proportion. And we also wanted more powerful bonds than the agnostic vector bonds that ex already exist. So to quickly present you the settings, so we have theta here, uh, which is equal to zero or one, and we have a M hypothesis. And H zero will be the position of the true null hypothesis or the more frequent type of, of observation. So we come back to that in a minute. And so for each position, we will say that theta Y equals zero if Y is in H zero and equal one or the right. So in the previous example, theta y equal one means that there is a chromosomal aberration at position one. And we are interested in the false discovery proportion, which is the number of zero in the selected set R divided by the cardinality of the set of the number of selected hypotheses. So this is classical way to account for the error, as you all know, I think. So there already exists some bond to control the false discovery proportion. For instance, uh, there is bonds that are valid simultaneously over all possible sets uh, of hypotheses. Uh, so these bonds are great because they are valid simultaneously. But in exchange, in exchange, sorry, <laughs> they are a bit conservative, meaning that they are a bit far from the true value of the false discovery proportion. So other bond to <coughs> sorry. So other bond are trying to deal with this problem, for instance, by adding the local structure and the hypothesis, or by restricted the path of type of selection of the hypothesis or that are really specific to linear models, for instance. Our goal was to propose an inter a post selection interval. So an interval such that the probability that the false discovery proportion belongs to this interval is higher than a given y minus alpha. And our assumption was that theta here is a random vector of latent variable, variable. And the idea was to work conditionally on x to simplify the operation of person bond and to also follow the works of Sun and Chi and 209 that say that theta and x follow an ideal Markov model. So we propose to do a post serial post selection interval working conditionally on X. And this interval can be achieved using the distribution of theta knowing conditionally on X. So this, uh, just a quick remark, this uh, work is in line with empirical bias methods like uh, local AVR or Efren Hall to um, one. So we we'll work at this probability, on this probability. So really quickly, I will reintroduce the Eiden Markov model. So the Eiden Markov model, so we have theta here that are latent variable. We are interested in finding the theta, but we don't observe it. But what we observe is x here. So the x are the say, statistics. And we say that uh, if conditionally on theta high is equal zero, x will have this density f zero. And if theta high is equal one, X high will have this density here F1. So the parameters are either the transition matrix A of this Markov chain and F1, or even the transition matrix A, F1, and X0 if the density is not known under the new hypothesis when theta high equals zero. So this work uh, follow, so as I already say, uh, work of Sun and high. 
to a nine. And uh, this model has been shown to be identifiable um, by Gaussian Harlan to 60. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, so just to point out something that this is a bit specific about our work, um, we have F0, which is the distribution under the null hypothesis, and F1, which is the, uh, the distribution under the alternative. And here there is two cases. There is a classical testing case where F0 is known and the goal is to find the observation x, y that depart from the distribution F0. And there is also another case, which is the outlier detection. In this case, F0 is unknown, and the idea is to detect the outlier that are the x, y that have an abnormal behavior. F0 will be the distribution under the predominant class, and the other one will be the abnormal one. And why, <coughs> sorry, why is this outlier detection is interesting is because, for instance, here, when I represent the statistics under the harm of the chromosome 7, comparing the two groups, what we can see here is not centered in zero at all. And it's a zero term statistic, so it's supposed to be centered in zero if there is no difference. So what we can see here is that pretty much all these harms is different between the two groups. But something that can be interesting is to find the positions that are even more different uh, between the two groups of patients, because maybe it's where the cancer strike at this position at first, and then because the part of the chromosome is weaker, weaker, it will be removed entirely. But to provide some cure and anything better or better understanding the illness, we have to find the first position where the chromosome, um, where the cancer strike. So for instance, maybe this part in orange at the first one. So what type of bond we will propose? So we propose the oracle bond. So basically this is a, a value that, uh, that uh, checks that uh, there is at least, there is less than a, a given number of zero in our set of hypotheses are. And what we propose, I don't have time to speak a lot about it here, but it's an iterative way to, to get it by comparing these two quantity recursively, by obtaining these two quantity recursively. And then, so this is an oracle bound and it depends on the parameter gamma, but we don't know gamma in practice. So we propose an algorithm to estimate gamma. And then what we propose is only to plug this estimation in our bound. But in practice, it didn't work because this is an estimation of the bound and it's not a bound of the bound. So sometimes the bound is lower than the, than the true value. The estimation of the bound is lower than the true bound. And there is no guarantee that the estimation will be higher than the in the false discovery proportion during this, uh, this case. So we were not happy about it. So what we propose to do is to correct with the bootstrap estimate of the difference between the plugging bound and the estimated bound. So I go really quickly on this, but we propose different way to correct for this error due to the fact that it's an estimation. And like that, we propose bound of the bound instead of just a, a bound. So now I will really shortly talk about numerical experiments. So first we propose some uh, numerical experiments that are within our model scenario. And what we can see is that the plug-in bond is in fact anti-conservative. So it's too often is smaller than the false discovery proportion than the true false discovery proportion. But the different bootstrap bonds that we propose respect the risk. And another thing that was great is that the bootstrap bonds are more powerful than the bonds from the literature. It's what expected because we are in our model and uh, the other bond doesn't take into account the fact that we are in a hidden Markov model. So then we try to challenge a bit our assumption. Firstly, when the selection policy use external knowledge, I'm not sure if I, talk too much about it in this presentation, I'm sorry. But one big important 
saying in our bond is that the selection policy cannot use external knowledge. So the user can select the hypothesis freely, but just by looking at uh, the X value, it cannot use external knowledge. And if it does, it will the bonds are not valid at all, actually. Um, well, if they were is unknown, so for the case of outlier detection, our bonds work very well, except for the nice one, but I didn't talk about this one, so it's cool. And another thing is that, so the model is identifiable only when the determinant of A, which is the transition matrix of the theta, is uh, different from zero. In this, when, this, when this determinant is equal to zero, it means that the uh, the hypotheses are independent, uh, and this will be not, this will not be identifiable. But our model is quite robust to small determinants. Our bond, sorry, is quite robust to small determinants. And the last simulation we were quite happy about was in a semi-simulated data that was not follow an either Markov model, but use true data that were name annotated by hand, so we know the truth. Um, and our bonds, our bootstrap bonds are more powerful than the science bonds, which is classical in the literature. So now I will turn back to the application. So we use here uh, data from Okamatur and Hal. Uh, we work only on chromosome seven, so we have uh, 13,000 uh, losses. So Position, genomic position, and we compare the number of uh, the DNA coding number of patients with endometriosis, patients without endometriosis. And we are testing in detecting the outlier. So we will estimate as zero. So this is the first result. So here in orange, here are the different sets that we choose to select. So the user can choose another set. And here is the false discovery proportion. So the little points are the estimation of the FDR using uh, some MPI procedure. And uh, here we have the interval. So what we can see is that the interval are really close to the FDR value. And because it's an easy case, you can clearly see the difference between the two groups, actually, so the first arm and the first and the second arm of the chromosome. In a more difficult scenario, so if we just focus on the first arm of the chromosome, what we can see here is that the interval are really wider than, uh, than before because it's a more complicated scenario. And you can just see that by looking at the FDR. So this is interesting to have interval and not only information and the expectancy. So this is the conclusion. So here yeah, I propose a post-selection interval on the false discovery proportion uh, to the oracle and the bootstrap bonds work. The set can freely be chosen by the, by the user, but it can't depend on external knowledge. And they are valid for both usual testing scenario and outlier detection. And the interval seems to be valid outside the model assumption. And I thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Mary, for an interesting talk. So we have uh, one hand raised from Steve Edwards. So Um, so while we're waiting for some more Q&A, uh, so I had a question about this um, uh, fact that the selection policy can't just depend on the external knowledge. Uh, I guess, is there some intuition why, or it, is there uh, some types of external knowledge you could use and others you couldn't? Um, so why is that when we uh, work the bond is not valid and uh, my intuition is that because um, if you if you do it on purpose for instance 
I will show you. Uh, no, I will not show you. Sorry. I don't know where they are. Ah, sorry. Uh, if you sorry. Uh, if you take in, if you do it on purpose, for instance, you select uh, the smaller p value with an AJ row or stuff like that. Uh, I think it didn't work because um, because so I don't know because uh, we kind of try to trick the model and um, and it's like a, a bias of selection. <laughs> I'm not sure it's really clear. My intuition is like. It's just he thinks it's an island mass of model with two groups, and he only see uh, things that seem to believe to belong in uh, the different groups. So he say everything is different, but uh, nothing is different if we do it on purpose. I don't know if it's unclear. Yeah, so it sounds, sounds kind of almost adversarial, uh, or almost like trying to trick trick the uh, the user. Policy, perhaps. Yeah, but and um, the thing is that if, for instance, someone read uh, read a paper about this per, this this uh, this week, this area seems to be really different between the two groups, and use and put it in the data. Instead, but even if we can't see it in the data, it will be. Too conservative because we will not know why you choose this area of looking at the data, and uh, that's a bit the problem. Okay, okay. Uh, so we have a question from Sophia. Uh, when you say the proposed selection intervals seem valid outside model assumptions, do you refer to the hidden Markov structure assumption or are you referring to something else? So I refer to the hidden Markov uh, assumption uh, and yeah. uh, because in the when we simulate this data, what we do is just um, we select a, a number of segments and uh, we select, uh, for instance, let's say 10 segments. So we select nine breakpoints without uh, taking into account the fact that we are in an hidden Markov model, without being in a hidden Markov model, and uh, the simulation works quite well. So we were happy about that because even if in practice it's logical that there is a huge area that will be different together uh, or not different together, uh, there is no reason that it's really an hidden Markov model. Sometimes it didn't, didn't really work in the NFOP. But in this case, it seems to work well in this uh, model when we are not in an Eiden Markov model at all. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much, Marie, again, for your talk. And I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, in the session. Thank you for very interesting and clear talks. So, what we'll do now is have a 10 minute break uh, for people to stretch their legs, get a coffee. Uh, so, we'll reconvene at quarter two, so 45 past, um, and we'll start the next session in 10 minutes. So let's see you shortly.
Okay, so we reconvene and get ready for this next session. So this session is on multiple testing in academia and industry. And we have representatives uh, from both today. So our first speaker is Frank Bretz, who is a distinguished biostatistician based for many years at Novartis and is also an adjunct professor at the Medical University of Vienna. His many research interests include multiple testing, adaptive designs, dose finding, and estimates. And today he will be giving a talk on multiple testing in clinical trials. Uh, so Frank, the uh, floor is yours. Okay, um, just a quick check whether you can see my slide and hear me well. <clears throat> yes, perfect, thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, David, for organizing this, you know, this event, which is really very interesting and inviting me to give this presentation uh, on optimal test procedures controlling the family wise um, expected loss. This is a joint work with Willy Mao and Xiao Lei Shen. And the motivation for this work, and the motivation for this work um, stems from a uh, clinical trial many years ago in a specific, specific form of breast cancer patients. And um, previous trials had suggested that certain mutant cell lines of the patients, um, you know, would lead to an increased sensitivity of the investigational treatment. So there was some evidence that um, the treatment would work particularly well in these mutant cell lines, as opposed in the non-mutant cell lines. Um, which then raised the question whether we should assess the treatment effect separately in these two subgroups of patients, mutants and non-mutant patients, resulting in two disjoint null hypotheses, H1 and H2. Um, now, if, if you would, uh, in, our, in our context, we would typically have to control the family-wise error rate. Um, so this is what we have to do in clinical trials. That's pretty standard. And if you do that, and for example, think about Bonferroni approach, then you would have to test H1 at level alpha over, uh, alpha over two, and likewise H2 at level alpha over two. Now, considering that these two subgroups of patients are disjoint, um, because you know, you're either mutant or a non-mutant patient, um, you come to think about that if H1, if that was related to the mutant cell line null hypothesis, if H1 was rejected incorrectly, then only the mutant patients would actually you know, suffer from that incorrect decision. That is, they would take a treatment um, that you know, they should not be marketed. And likewise with H2, if um, H2 was incorrectly rejected, it would only impact the non-mutant patients. And from that perspective, you could argue that why I'm not testing H1 at level alpha and likewise H2 at level alpha, because for each subgroup of patients, the type 1 air weight seems to be well controlled, although overall the family device air weight could then obviously be close to 2 alpha. So what the family device air weight um, does, it really controls the, you know, the probability of at least one type 1 error. And the consequences of incorrect rejections are treated equally, regardless whether you're rejecting one or both nulls incorrectly, and regardless of the impact on, you know, for in this uh, last example, on the patient population that's being um, impacted by your wrong decisions. However, in practice, there are obviously incorrect decisions may inflict, dif may inflict different losses um, on patients, on healthcare costs, and so on. So this is why it might be quite reasonable to at least consider um, that incorrect rejection of HI would lead to a certain loss lambda I for each um, I equal to one or two. And that also um, in the population example that we have just seen, the losses are additive. That is incorrectly rejecting both nulls would inflict a loss, um, a total loss of lambda one plus lambda two. So going back to the breast cancer example, um, we may attribute a total loss of, say, one unit to the wrong decision that um, there is a treatment effect in both subgroups if, in fact, there is no effect in either one. And it seems reasonable then to assume that an incorrect decision related to just one of the subgroups, say um, H1, um, then you could 
um, assign a loss a lambda one, which is less than one, and likewise with H2 and lambda two being less than one. So, and in this particular example, you could then choose um, the losses lambda one and lambda two relative um, to the proportional size of the subpopulations relative to the overpopulation. So all these kind of considerations led us to think um, whether we should look more, um, you know, in more depth into some decision theoretic frameworks where incorrect decisions, uh, de rejections can be treated unequally by assigning different loss values. And of course, this is not per se, it's not a new topic at all. Eric Lehmann already had published on this, um, you know, um, in the 1950s. And um, we, we, we have been, you know, in the literature, you can see quite a few papers using decision, decision theoretic frameworks in the context of large scale multiple testing. But in our context of clinical trials and low dimensional tests, uh, testing um, or low dimensional multiple testing problems, you see many less applications of such a framework. So that's the motivation. And in order to set the scene, we will need a little bit of notation. So we are concerned about testing M, M unknown two parameters, theta one through theta M, and out of a uh, parameter space, capital theta. And we are considering this one-sided null hypothesis, theta I being less than zero, uh, or less or equal to zero. And then if you reject it, then we will assume that theta I is larger than zero. In addition, we are going to look into partition of our parameter space capital theta by looking at all the combinations that is intersections of nulls and alternatives. And, and, and certainly we have like two to the power of M of those intersections and combinations. In addition, we need some action space. So this is um, denoted by uh, script A. So this will be the Cartesian product of our sets of zero and ones um, in the sense that if I have a set of or a vector of decisions, d1 through dm, then these decisions will be um, denoted by one if I reject the null hypothesis and zero otherwise. And so that's in that sense, we need to script A um, to denote our action space. Okay, um, with these preliminaries, well, I guess we are ready to define a decision rule, um, which is a function based on some observed evidence such as p-values and um, that goes into this action space um, you know, of the zero and ones. And such decision rules can be considered as generalizations of conventional multiple test procedures. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess towards the end of the presentation, I may come back um, and, and uh, we will see how some of the conventional multiple test procedures just fall out as special cases. Now, um, in order to define loss and gain functions, um, we start off slightly more general in defining so-called score functions, which assign a non-negative value to each decision D with respect to a parameter value theta. And um, more formally, loss functions are then becoming score functions that would assign a positive value to an incorrect decision of the null hypothesis um, um, and while quantifying the associated costs. And likewise, um, gain functions will be score functions that assign a positive value to correctly reject the null hypothesis by quantifying the associate benefits. Now, but instead of looking at the score functions, um, you know, on this continuous value of theta, um, we are rather looking into step score functions to start off with. And um, you see that we're replacing theta by R of theta. Um, so this is the indicator function um, for the partition sets of the parameter space um, capital theta that I had introduced on the previous slide. And, um, and it really means that, you know, whenever you reject the null hypothesis, um, you, know, you, you, you know, the costs and the benefits would be constant um, over that region, um, over these partition elements. So specifically, um, if you see this R of theta, then um, it will be a zero if theta i is, 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 is part of the null hypothesis and otherwise r of theta i will become one if it's an, you know, this element is the theta i is part of the alternative. So with that, um, we can formally define additive step loss functions, um, script L. Um, you see it here on the right-hand side. The lambda i's, um, you know, um, I had intuitively um, introduced them a couple of slides ago. So these are fixed constants that need to be 
identified and set in, 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 uh, into place um, before you actually start your clinical trial. But then you have this product of di times one minus r of theta i. And essentially, if you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis, then, well, di is the decision, becomes one, r of theta i becomes zero because it's, it's a null hypothesis. Um, uh, theta i is part of your null hypothesis. So this, this product then becomes one. And this is the only case, it's only if you reject the null hypothesis incorrectly, that will contribute um, to the overall loss with your associated uh, cost lambda i. In all other cases, there will be no contribution to the overall loss. And so very similarly, we can introduce additive step gain functions. Um, you see it on the right hand side, we have the gamma i, so these are the, uh, the gains, so to speak. And, uh, and this product di times r theta i becomes one only if you reject the null hypothesis correctly. In all other cases, that product would be zero and you're not, uh, co you're not contributing to the overall gain. So with that, we are ready um, to look into what we call valid decision rules. And valid decision rules are those that where for a given loss function, uh, you are controlling the expected loss at a pre-specified threshold alpha for any configuration of your parameter vector. And this expected loss, this is in analogy to our family device error rate, we call it family device expected loss, FWEL. And um, we are trying to control it um, at this, uh, you know, we bound it by alpha um, for any configuration of thetas that, um, and therefore we call it like we would be strongly controlling the family device expected loss in analogy, in, in analogy to the strong um, family device error rate control. And what we would like to do in the remainder of our work is then to search for optimal valid decision rules that maximize the family device expected gain which is defined obviously very similarly as to the family device expected loss above, while controlling this family device expected loss at level alpha for a given loss function and assuming continuous test statistic. Now you see um, that um, we don't follow the quote unquote classical decision analytic approach, which often um, you know, utilizes a utility function and optimize the utility function, which kind, which kind of combines losses and gains. And we are not doing that, but we are treating gains and losses separate because this is how we work in clinical trials. Um, we are trying to uh, maintain the type one error rate. And then among all the main type one error rate controlling procedures, we select the one that maximizes power. So that is in full analogy to that sort of approach. And also, also if you see the alpha, obviously it's again, um, you know, it's, a, it's an analogy um, to our type one error rate control. Um, in, in the classical sense, I mean, the alpha has a different meaning here because we are looking at a very different um, error rate, but um, yeah, but we have chosen to, say, to use the same notation out of convenience. Now, um, we can make one quick statement, which is that the search for these optimal valid decision rules can be restricted to what we call exhaustive decision rules. So these would be those that, where the expected loss is atta attains level alpha for at least one specific parameter configuration. And you can formally state that for additive step loss and gain functions, a valid decision rule that is non-exhaustive is inadmissible. And um, this of course um, sounds very useful because you kind of, um, you know, um, you can restrict your, 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 your space over which you're trying to optimize. And, and you can easily imagine that if you have an, an, uh, an a non-exhaustive decision rule, then you, know, you can e easily improve upon that. So with that, um, um, we are first looking into uh, point alternatives. Um, so whether theta i is expected to um, take a specific value, theta i plus. And um, if you then look into optimal decision rules, we would like to maximize the expected gain among all valid exhaustive decision rules for a fixed parameter, uh, theta one plus through sweet theta m plus. Now you may have noticed that in the gain function, we have replaced uh, the R of theta by the one vector so that this gain function is independent of theta and, but it also reflects conventional power concepts in the sense that any rejection would actually contribute to the total gain, regardless of whether the, the null is true or not. 
And this is also how, at least in clinical trials, we would sometimes calculate power. Um, it's regardless of whether the null hypothesis is true or not. But um, as irrespectively, you can also show that um, the optimal rules, whether you use the one vector or you use R theta, are usually very close to each other. And we have a, a result on that as well. Now, the more interesting case, of course, are, are composite alternatives. Um, that is the ones, you know, if you really test um, theta one, uh, theta i being less or equal to zero versus um, the, 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 the complement. And in this case, you will have to account for the uncertainty in the unknown parameters. And, and one way of doing that is to maximize a weighted average of the expected gain. You see this in the formula um, that, um, yeah, you see the expectation uh, multiplied by some, um, you know, uh, suit, uh, with a suitable density vector, uh, with a suitable density um, omega. And, and in the literature, that's, that's known as Bayes gain. We also looked into um, maximizing the minimum regret. And, um, but, you know, the results, um, I'm not going to into details of the results, I don't have time, but we looked into those as well. So I think these would be the two typical approaches um, that could be used. But we like the Bayes game because you essentially stay on the same scale as the original problem. So it's easy to interpret as a weighted average of the expected gain. Now, um, there's one result we could show um, is that maximizing, maximizing the Bayes gain is actually equivalent to maximizing the expected gain E star that you see here, which is with respect to the compound distribution F star of, of your distribution function of the p-values. And, and this result is uh, really is a great um, simplification of um, and, and leads to considerable savings in, in computation time because it essentially says that Bayes optimal decision rules can be determined by finding the optimal decision rule for a point hypothesis. And so the, we are back to the results on the previous slide. So these are some of the general results. And um, what we thought doing next is then actually look into specific forms of decision rules. And um, so I'm going to show a couple of results now. Um, so I'm going to specialize the results from the previous slides for what we call rectangular decision rules, specifically for two hypotheses. And this is motivated um, by conventional multiple test procedures, specifically the SIMES test. And if I show you this picture, you may recognize the SIMES test. Um, um, so we have here the P1, P2 plane, and you have certain boundaries, uh, Bs and As and B primes. And then um, you have this, um, you know, elements A11, A10, A01, and A00. So these are the four possible outcomes, whether you're rejecting both null hypotheses or maybe just one of the two, or you don't reject any of them. And um, if you look at this counter um, um, then uh, of the rejection region here, then you will recognize the SIMES test. So we call it rectangular decision rule. And um, this, um, and we would like to understand a little bit better whether we can find more concrete results um, in um, searching for optimal decision rules in, um, within this class of decision rules. And indeed, if you are willing to assume independent p-values p1 and p2, you can express the family-wise expected loss according to this bunch of formulas that you're seeing here. So these formulas itself, they are not so relevant, but it's nice to see that you can really write them down in such an explicit form um, due to the simplified nature of our decision rules. And um, you know, in this independence condition of P1 and P2 for us was quite convenient. Um, if you remember the motivating example was really about two disjoint subgroups of patients, the mutants and the non-mutant patients. So um, we were quite happy um, to work under this independent condition. Now, um, the results that you're seeing here hold for point null hypothesis. Um, they, however, become upper bounds for the expected losses in the more general cases, um, thus leading to valid decision rules for composite null hypothesis. That is, um, you know, under the point null hypothesis, you can express um, this function f, capital F, quasi explicitly, but um, Otherwise, if in the more general case, the probability depends on the parameter theta i as well as the particular test and the sample sizes being employed. 
Now, with these expressions that you see on the top of the page, um, we can then actually do some rearrangement and we can be even for more specific because what we still want to do is to really, um, you know, find some constraints possibly um, on these um, parameters. We have six parameters, um, the A's, the B's and the B primes. And so the simple rearrangement of the terms on, from the previous slide, um, you can then express these conditions um, so that any valid rectangular decision rule will have to satisfy um, these three sets of, or the set of the three in, in inequalities. Now, if you think about um, optimizing over the space of these six parameters, A1, A2, B1 and B2, and B1 prime and B2 prime, well, that would be the unconstrained version of the decision rules where you can freely choose those six parameters within the restrictions above. However, if you um, rem remember that we had talked about exhaustiveness, and if you would like um, to restrict the space to exhaustive valid decision rules, then we have one free parameter less because one of these um, uh, inequalities above will become an inequality, will become an inequality, it will be sharp. Um, so that would be one way um, you know, to reduce your, 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 your search for your optimality result. But um, you can also impose other constraints, further constraints on your parameters and therefore reduce the original optimization problem essentially to one or two dimensional problems. And, and the nice thing is also that it may reflect additional practical considerations. So we looked into different um, co uh, you know, constraints on those parameters and I'm just going to show two of these. Um, one is um, what we call symmetric rule uh, where you essentially um, setting the same boundaries for both of these hypotheses. So in each of these two dimensions in the P1, P2 plane that I had shown before in the graph. So um, you, you use the same A, the same B and the same B prime. And if you do that, then the set of valid and exhaustive symmetric decision rules can be stated by the set in terms of A and B that you're seeing here, um, which only depends then of course on your um, boundary uh, on your threshold alpha and the two losses, lambda one and lambda two. Now, um, you could also look into what we call separable rules. And what you're doing here is that collab you collapse for each of the two hypotheses, um, the thresholds A and B, and you set B prime to the maximum value of one. Um, and um, if you do that, then the set of valid and exhaustive separate decision rules becomes um, like this expression here. So it only depends on C1 and C2. And the nice thing about this is that you kind of remove this middle quadrant uh, where both reject whole hypothesis could be rejected like the Symes quadrant. And, um, and um, if you do that, then this set um, will hold also for stochastically dependent p-values. So you don't have to rely necessarily on independent p-values, but it really, um, you could use any dependent structure because um, your expectation then only depends on the marginal distributions of the p-values. Okay, I guess, um, so these are some results, specializing those results um, from the general results before. Um, I would have a few results also going specifically into the family-wise air weight as a special case. Um, I guess I'm running out of time, so I will be very brief about this. Um, instead of using additive loss functions, if you are willing to use um, binary loss functions, um, then you actually the family reverse air weight falls out as a special case. Um, and you see that here in the expression for the binary loss function is um, that um, you're looking at the maximum of these products di times one minus r of theta i. And since this product always becomes one, if you reject uh, uh, incorrectly your hypothesis HI, taking the maximum of all these products means that, well, um, the loss will be one if you reject at least one true null hypothesis. And yeah, and not surprisingly in this specific case, the family-wise expected loss indeed becomes exactly the family-wise error rate. And um, the valid and exhaustive conditions could then be derived um, for different decision rules very similar to what I have shown on the previous slides. And I'm going to skip this slide, but essentially if you do all this optimization, um, you really get 
you know, um, choices for the parameters that really are very sensible and essentially you are going, going to recover um, all these uh, well-known test procedures um, in the literature on family bus air with like closed science test, CIDAC test, and the weighted version of these two procedures, which I thought was very nice to see that coming out, out of your um, optimization routine. So concluding, um, we felt um, and motivated by specific clinical trial setting, we felt that the family device airway is not always the appropriate measure. Um, instead, we looked into family device expected losses, which take into account the relative importance of the hypothesis and, and the possible consequences of rejecting them, um, consequences for the patients, for the healthcare system, the costs implied, and so on. Um, with our approach, we try to follow the classical hypothesis testing thinking by controlling um, you know, the expected loss and, and, and then maximizing expected gain. Um, but we also feel there's a lot of interesting future work. Um, you know, for example, what happens if you look into continuous loss and gain functions, non-rectangular decision rules, and so on. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Frank, for a very interesting talk. Um, looks very uh, nice work. So, if people have questions, they can put them in the Q and A. Uh, so, while we're waiting for that, uh, could I ask a question about the phase gain? Uh, so, to calculate that, does there need to be a choice of priors, and if so, what choices did you make? Um, well, we didn't have, we never really run it in a real setting. Um, so I can't tell you <laughs> from a practical point of view which prior to use. Um, we obviously we have a toy example and we just try to um, use uninformative priors. Um, but um, yeah, so a short answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I guess if this proposal was going to be used in practice, um, could you see that there might be some kind of discussion between the choices of these lambdas and various parameters? Um, and I guess the question is who, who would be setting those parameters? Would it be the regulator or the uh, sponsor of the drug? Or how, how might you envisage that, that taking place in practice? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I, I really have never, I mean, as I've said before, we didn't really apply it, um, um, but, um, I think it would be quite a change of thinking about our clinical trials <laughs> if we start thinking about lambdas and, and, and um, in particular the lambda eyes, obviously. Um, now for this, um, for the um, population example that I have shown, I mean, it's quite convenient or reasonable to assume that you just take the proportion of the patients of the, you know, of the overall population. And I think that probably should help you to guide your choice of lambdas. But in principle, the methods that, you know, the way how, how we have written up and how we think about it should also be applicable to other types of problems. Like if you have, um, you know, unequally important endpoints like a primary and a secondary endpoint. And then I think the choice of lambda i would be much more difficult because it's not so natural um, to think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, one particular application I could imagine moving forward is also master protocol designs. I think where you have all these different treatments and um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I think there would be some way of, you know, um, maybe weaving in this, this, this type of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, so we have a question from Florian who asks uh, similar lines. What is the impact of choosing Lambda 1 and Lambda 2 differently for a second? the risk of approving an inefficacious drug for either subgroup, especially if later you constrain the rejection bounds to be equal. Sorry, I need to read this question. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, no, that's a good question. And, and um, that's where I would think, right? Um, uh, yeah, um, so if it for this, um, uh, so thanks for the question, Florian. And so um, it, it, for the example that I had, where we had two separate disjoint subpopulations, um, then, um, I mean, and the original example, the real original example actually comes from um, like a, a global clinical trials where we had, um, where we were asked to use two different endpoints um, for the US FDA and the European agency. 
And then it comes the question, do we have to adjust for multiplicity or not? And the, you know, one of the common um, arguments as well, you know, we are being asked by two different agencies why we should then adjust for multiplicity. But I think the, you can formally use the results that we have shown here that a, an incorrect decision um, for the FDA will only impact the US population and vice versa, an incorrect decision for the, for the endpoint chosen by the EMA in Europe will only impact the European regulators. So I think that gives a nice um, re, um, reason why you don't have to adjust for multiplicity because the risk of approving an ineffective drug is, is really controlled by region in this case. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Uh, so we have time for, for one more question and we'll defer the remaining one to the panel discussion when we have more time. Uh, so the next question was from Sophia. She said, thanks, Frank, great talk. I like the mimicking of the hypothesis testing in the way to approach this. I wonder if you could say a bit more on what parameters would be involved in considering different power metrics or different weights to different alternatives of interest. Yeah, so we made it very simple by just looking um, at these additive gain functions. So um, obviously we made two choices, right? We, we, we consider the gains to be additive. So that's something that could be considered and you could use different functions instead of just taking the sum. And we're um, talking about, you know, um, different gains for each of these hypotheses. Again, the gains could possibly reflect somehow in our, in the, in our population example, uh, the size of the population but maybe in other applications it, become, it would become a bit more um, difficult how to, you know, at least it would be more interesting to discuss the choice of the gamma eyes. So I'm not exactly sure whether that addressed your question, but um, yeah, I mean, this would be the, you know, the, this, you know the, the parameters where you could, you know, fine tune, so to speak. So the choice of the gamma eyes and actually the overall function, whether it's additive function or other functions. But thank you, Frank. Uh, so we have <clears throat> two more questions, which will defer for a discussion. Uh, but thanks again for a really nice talk. So our uh, next speaker is Ruth Eller, who is an associate professor at the Department of Statistics and Operations Research at Tel Aviv University. And her research interests include multiple testing, post-selection inference, and non-parametric statistical tests. And her talk today will be on optimal multiple testing procedures. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do you see my uh, slides? Yes, it's fine, thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, it's very much related actually to the previous talk. Uh, we did not coordinate this. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the motivation is again, is also two subgroups in a clinical trial, um, uh, but I'll go in order. Our perspective was a bit different than our starting point. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Abba Krieger and Saron Hosset. Um, okay, so if we so our starting point is actually uh, when we have a single hypothesis, uh, then the goal is to maximize power. The constraint is to control the type one error probability uh, so that it's at most a predefined uh, level alpha. And we seek the decision policy uh, that basically for every realized uh, uh, sample, uh, we have a binary decision, uh, which I denoted here by capital D. So uh, we can formulate this as an optimization problem. So if P is the p-value of the likelihood ratio test statistic, uh, the density uh, under the alternative is, uh, is denoted uh, given AG is equal to one means that uh, the null hypothesis is false. <clears throat> density under the null, which is just uh, the uniform uh, uh, zero one is denoted like this. Then we have the optimization problem. Basically, we are find, trying to find a maximum, we're trying to find D, uh, the policy that maximizes the power subject to type one uh, error uh, probability control. And this is, uh, the, the solution here is uh, well known. So this is an infinite dimensional integer problem and the name and person gives us uh, the solution. So we can use it in clinical trials. Uh, patients are randomly assigned to two treatment arms. Uh, sample size is calculated to achieve this desired optimal power with the optimal test that pre-specified pre treatment effect, subject to the constraint that uh, the type 1 probability is most alpha when there is no effect. 
However, nowadays, more than one hypothesis may be simultaneously tested, like in uh, the example discussed in the previous talk. And the question then is how to design uh, the optimal testing procedure. So what I'm going to, uh, um, the, the way uh, the rest of the talk is going to be is I'm going to discuss our motivating application, which is again two, two subgroups, um, and then uh, our approach and uh, the algorithm, and uh, finally we'll apply it and hopefully convince that it's useful. Okay. So uh, the APEX trial examined the advantage of betrixaban over enoxaparin in patients at risk of venous thrombosis. Patients were randomly assigned to the two treatment arms. The sample size was computed assuming that the event rate is 7.5% uh, for uh, the control group and that there is a 35% rejection in the treatment group. And there were two subgroups that were of interest, those that are with an elevated D-dimer level, and there were uh, 3,870 such patients, and the others, uh, 2,400. So we have these two subgroups, and uh, we want to uh, decide uh, on the multiple testing procedure for this trial. Uh, so um, some notation, HI is the indicator of uh, the status of the alpha hypothesis. Zero means that it's a true null, and one means that it's a, a false null. A true, theta I equals to zero if uh, it's null, the treatment uh, um, has no effect, and theta I is less than zero otherwise. DI indicates whether the I is null is rejected. This is our binary decision. So uh, the recommendation by regulatory agencies is strong family-wise error control. So Frank uh, argued just in the previous talk that it, they, they could maybe consider something else, but right now uh, the standard by far is, is just uh, this one. So we are continuing with it. So what does it mean strong family-wise error control? It, it means uh, control of the global null. So the probability of at least one discovery when both uh, both nulls are true, has to be less than or equal to alpha, but also under any other configuration. So if the probability, uh, the probability of uh, false positive, if, um, if we reject the one that is a true null, even though the other one is not null. This, this also, we want to guarantee that it's at most alpha. <clears throat> uh, so uh, the common practice is to actually, we uh, now take some, there are off-the-shelf procedures uh, that control uh, the family-wise error in the strong sense. Uh, so let's just uh, select one of these uh, for, uh, for the study. Uh, so what they did in the Apex trial, actually, they decided to test in order. Basically, uh, they, uh, at level alpha of uh, 0.025, they, they um, first test uh, the first subgroup, and uh, if the p-value is less than 0.025, then they go on to test also the other subgroup. And this was actually unfortunate uh, because uh, in their study, uh, the p-value was above alpha in the first group, uh, but then below alpha in uh, much, much smaller than alpha in the second uh, um, in the second group. But if the decision offhand was uh, to test in order, then they can't. Um, uh, th then basically uh, they, they stop here, they have no discoveries and everything else is just uh, exploratory, it's not a confirmatory evidence. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, uh, it was argued that actually when you choose an off-the-shelf procedure, it's better to uh, try one uh, that, uh, uh, that, that still allows a discovery also uh, for, for uh, the other uh, endpoint. Uh, rather than testing in order. And two popular procedures are, one of them is uh, close to far, which basically uh, for the global null, it looks at the sum of uh, the Z values uh, or Z scores, where a Z score is just the inverse of the P value, where phi is the CDF of the standard normal. And uh, so uh, if uh, the global null is, um, with this test is uh, rejected uh, at level alpha and uh, the individual p-value is uh, rejected at level alpha, then the decision is to reject that hypothesis. Uh, another um, popular procedure is the one that uh, Frank uh, actually mentioned before. It's uh, just uh, using uh, for the intersection hypothesis, the SIMES test. Uh, so it's basically a homeless procedure. 
uh, which uh, will reject uh, the hypothesis if its p-value is less than alpha over two or if both hypotheses are at most alpha. Uh, if we look at the um, at, at the uh, decision policies here, uh, this is a decision policy for uh, the closed twofer, and uh, here is uh, the one for HOMO. So we see that they're, they're quite uh, different from each other. Uh, what we have here is in green, uh, it's uh, the realizations for which we will reject both hypotheses. In black, we will reject only the first one, and in red, we will reject only the second one. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, we will decide on rejection of the first hypothesis at level alpha equals to 0 0.025 uh, if uh, these are the two p-values that we got, 0 0.02 and 0 0.003, um, but we will uh, reject by closed sufer only. And that's because both hypotheses are quite small, so there is full enough evidence, and indeed it's uh, somewhere here, it's good enough uh, for, based on uh, closed sufer. It's not based on uh, HOMO. Um, whereas if uh, the first p-value is actually smaller, it's alpha over two or uh, smaller still, then of course uh, Homo's procedure will also reject it and then it will be rejected by both. However, if uh, the large p-value is actually much larger, it's 0.3, uh, then oh, it's uh, the policy, uh, the only policy that will reject is uh, Homo's and uh, uh, close to four will uh, no longer reject. So, uh, so we see uh, the, the, the choice uh, intuitively is one that, well, if you believe that uh, both hypotheses are actually non-null, uh, then it's better to uh, uh, choose the off-the-shelf closed so stufer procedure because uh, there will be pooling of evidence and that will help you make a discovery. Whereas if you think that it could very well be that it's uh, only one of the hypotheses is uh, um, non-null, uh, then it's better uh, to use the homos procedure. Um, okay, so uh, now I'm going to move to our formulation, uh, which is uh, to look actually at the multiple testing problem as an optimization problem. Uh, so basically, we don't start with a policy or an off-the-shelf procedure or some uh, class of uh, uh, procedures uh, that, uh, that we want to uh, tailor parameters to, but we, we actually are, are starting is like a name and person. We have the objectives, we have the constraints, and we solve an optimization problem um, for, that, that will uh, basically result in a policy. So, um, so the, the components of the optimization problem, we need to, the objective of interest, which is some form of power, the constraint, which uh, we talked about that it should be the strong family-wise error rate control at level alpha uh, from uh, because of regulatory agencies, but it could uh, very well be generalized. Um, and maybe other restrictions on the decision rule, the decision rule that, we, that may be desired, and I'll talk about these. And then once we define uh, the optimization problem, uh, all is, what is left to do is to solve it and to find the actual policy. So uh, uh, let's uh, first uh, discuss uh, the objective, uh, what we want to maximize. It could be various things. Uh, so for example, it can be what I call here pi average, which is uh, the expected uh, average number of true discoveries, given that both hypotheses are false. It could be pi any, which is uh, the probability of at, will, at least one discovery, given that both hypotheses and null hypotheses are false. It could be pi one, which is the probability of uh, a true discovery, um, given that exactly one of the hypotheses uh, is false, uh, where here I can assume uh, some uh, prior probability of the hypothesis being false. The simplest one, if no other information, is that each of them has uh, the same uh, probability of one half of being uh, uh, false now. And uh, uh, another objective uh, which uh, we found particularly useful is this one. It's actually the combination uh, of these two. And uh, what it is, is just uh, the probability of at least one true discovery, given that uh, at least one of the hypotheses is indeed false. Again, under this prior probability that uh, the probability of each hypothesis uh, being false is uh, half. So uh, in terms of, uh, so, so the, the analyst has to choose um, the, the objective. Uh, unified notation is uh, that the power function uh, looks like this. Okay, so, so D1 is the decision on whether to uh, 
uh, reject uh, the first hypothesis, and A1 is uh, a uh, function of the p-values um, that is uh, in, in the integrand of the power uh, definition. So for example, if we look at uh, pi any, uh, then actually uh, what we have here is, um, uh, this, this is, a, this is a, the, the, uh, the power. Uh, so basically A1 is equal to zero, A2 is equal to zero, but uh, A3 is equal to uh, the likelihood where uh, D3 we define as the maximum between uh, the two uh, uh, decisions, D1 and D2. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the, the, the power functions that we're going to use in this talk. Uh, it can be generalized. And if you do have a prior on uh, 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 prior distribution on the nanol parameters, uh, then it can be integrated and the objective becomes a base objective. Or uh, if uh, you actually, uh, you, it's, it had, doesn't have to be just a point objective, but it can actually be a maximum objective that where you want to uh, maximize the uh, minimum uh, power over a range of, uh, of possibilities. Okay. So uh, now, so, so we have our objective. Uh, we know that we have strong uh, family-wise error control. Um, uh, as the constraints, and uh, we, we may uh, uh, also consider other uh, restrictions, and one of them is the marginal and nominal alpha uh, policy to seek this one, which means uh, that actually we, we don't want to reject uh, hypothesis where the p-value is greater than alpha. An intuitive motivation may be that uh, if um, for a single hypothesis, we won't reject for p-value greater than alpha, then now that we have two hypotheses, why would we reject for p-value greater than alpha? So we can further impose this and call a policy that also satisfies this, a marginally nominal alpha policy. Uh, another uh, restriction uh, that we may be interested in is um, the weekly monotone policy. Uh, which uh, means that basically if we, uh, we have realization P and a realization Q and the realization Q in every coordinate is smaller than P, so Q1 is less than P1 and Q2 is less than uh, P2, then if we reject uh, uh, with P, we will necessarily also reject with Q, which makes sense. Um, okay, so the formulation as an optimization problem, so uh, the optimal marginal nominal alpha policy will be the solution to this. Uh, we have our objective. We want to policy that maximizes the objective subject to strong family-wise error constraint. And uh, we, don't, we won't reject uh, um, if the p-value is greater than alpha. And this uh, we actually have a full solution to. It's, it will turn out to be uh, the same uh, full solution to uh, the weekly monotone policy, which is uh, uh, replaces this constraint uh, with this one uh, for the normal means problem. Okay, so uh, we have our approach. Uh, we have uh, the actual formulation for, for two hypotheses. So now I'm going to describe the solution and uh, the algorithm that results, which is super simple. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So uh, the first thing to note is that we actually have only, it seems like we have an infinite number of uh, integral constraints, but we don't. So we actually have only a single uh, uh, integral constraint. <clears throat> and the reason is that uh, uh, if, uh, because we, we will reject only p-values that are less than alpha, then necessarily if exactly one of the hypotheses is uh, uh, true now, then the probability of making uh, uh, a false positive of rejecting it is less than or equal to alpha necessarily. So actually the only uh, constraint that we actually are left with is the global null constraint that uh, we need to require that it will be less than or equal to alpha, which means that the probability uh, that uh, at least one of the high, um, uh, at least one of the hypotheses is rejected when the global null is true, when both hypotheses are true nulls, uh, is at most alpha. And therefore, the problem reduces to something much simpler. So this is uh, the unified notation for our objective. We want D that maximizes this objective subject to the uh, integral uh, constraint and uh, uh, the fact that we don't reject uh, when the p-value is greater than alpha. And what we need to look at really is uh, only at uh, this L-shaped uh, region, which is uh, 
uh, where the either the, the first p-value is less than alpha or the second p-value is less than alpha. Okay. Uh, so uh, the policy uh, is actually, the solution is actually similar to a Neyman-Pearson-like uh, solution. It's as simple as that. Uh, if we look at um, the score, uh, which is the integrand of the objective, uh, but replacing uh, the decision uh, by the, the indicator that the p-value is less than alpha, uh, then... Um, the, the, the algorithm uh, is as follows. Uh, well, first of all, as we, we said, that we only look uh, consider region, the rejection regions uh, where at least one of the p-values is less than alpha. Okay, we only, we, our starting point is uh, this area here. Now we need to continue trimming, so because the global null on this is greater than alpha. So how should we trim it? Well, uh, the score, we, are, we want to actually keep in the rejection regions those uh, uh, values for which the sc score is maximal. Uh, what we, um, our constraint, the global null constraint doesn't care which, uh, uh, which points uh, in, 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 uh, in the plane we are, we are not, we're putting in the rejection region because they all are, uh, uh, as long as the total mass there will be less than alpha. But for the objective, we care about, we want actually to put in the rejection, the one where the score is the largest. So that it's, uh, so all we need to do is just um, take all the scores that are greater than, than a threshold T. So where the threshold T is determined so that the global null is indeed uh, uh, exactly alpha. So we retain all of these and then we're done basically. Uh, we will uh, reject the uh, ith hypothesis if its p-value is less than or equal to alpha and its score is greater than, uh, than the threshold. That's it. Okay. So um, uh, in, let's apply it. Uh, so first of all, so, so the scores that we considered uh, was uh, pi average, expected uh, average number of true, uh, true positives. Then the score uh, is like this. Okay, so we want to put uh, into the rejection region, those uh, the score that is greater than uh, the threshold that guarantees global null uh, at most alpha, or if it's pi n, the probability of at least one um, uh, true positive, given that both are, are false, then uh, this is uh, the score um, for this one. For pi one, uh, the score uh, is this one, where pi one is the probability of uh, rejecting the true positive, given that exactly one of the hypotheses is false. And the one that uh, is uh, most interesting, I think, is uh, this score, which combines pi n and pi 1, which is the probability that um, uh, we, uh, uh, we make at least one true discovery, given that uh, at least one of the hypotheses uh, uh, is false. Okay. So let's see how the what happens to uh, our policies. Uh, how do they look like? Uh, so we have here uh, the optimal policies for the apex trials for uh, the four uh, different uh, power uh, objectives that we had. Uh, so uh, for pi n and pi average, they actually coincide, and this is what uh, the rejection regions looks like. Uh, so basically, uh, until um, uh, um, at Alpha of 0.025, we reject uh, we reject both here. Uh, here, black we reject only the first one. Red we reject only the second one. Uh, it looks similar to close to fur, but it's not exactly uh, what we have here. Is um, uh, the horizontal and vertical lines are, are at uh, the quantile uh, uh, the the uh, 0.025 quantile of uh, the standard normal. Uh, so we see that actually the rejection, just to aid, uh, to help that the rejection is actually not symmetric. And the reason is that under the alternative, we actually don't have the same uh, signal to noise ratio uh, because uh, the, um, uh, the sample size is not the same. So for, for the first hypothesis, uh, in the control arm, we have 1,956, and in the treated arm, we have 1,914. And for uh, the second hypothesis, we have 1,218 and 1,198. So basically, uh, these, these two are the alternative values on which uh, we are optimizing in our objectives. So it's not symmetric. So we have, so this is the policy for pi and pi average, resembles close to fur, but it's not. For uh, optimizing pi one, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the way it looks. Uh, it resembles a, a homeless procedure, but it's not. 
and uh, for, uh, for optimizing the probability of at least one true discovery, given that uh, at least one of the hypothesis is false, uh, this is uh, how the, uh, the rejection area looks like. So it's really, it's a sort of combination of these two and it's, but it's novel, it's, it's a, different, uh, um, a different policy. And uh, um, well, so what we have here is uh, basically uh, uh, the powers. Uh, so of course, uh, for the objective, uh, uh, the, the objective for which we optimize in this uh, power metric will also be the, the highest. Uh, so uh, pi average, and uh, so uh, if we're optimizing for pi average, then uh, uh, if we're looking now at the power of the policy, uh, the pi average, the expected number of uh, average uh, true uh, discoveries given that both are false, then it's highest uh, here. And for the other policies, which is the policy that optimizes for pi one, uh, for the combinations of pi n and pi one, and for the two uh, after shelf procedures, Tufer and Homo, it's uh, smaller, uh, but uh, close Tufer is actually close uh, to, uh, uh, to the optimal. Homo is a little bit uh, uh, further away. Uh, for uh, pi n, we see uh, a similar, similar behavior. Uh, for pi one, uh, so uh, the optimal uh, uh, policy has a, a pi one power of 0.78, um, and uh, uh, the combined uh, the combination of pi n and pi one is close to it, uh, but close to is uh, much uh, further away. So it's uh, no good if exactly one of the hypotheses is false. Uh, Homel is actually uh, very close as well, and. Uh, for this, the probability of at least one true positive, given that uh, both uh, that at least one of the hypotheses is false, uh, then this is uh, the optimal power uh, also in this metric. And it it uh, these are uh, the other ones again. It's uh, the the policy that optimizes for pi average of pi n. It doesn't do very well uh, under uh, this metric, nor does close to fair. Uh, so what we have is this, this novel policy actually dominates Homo's procedure for the power measures considered. Uh, so if we just look uh, at this, when we design the procedure, we may actually choose uh, to select it as, as the procedure uh, um, uh, to apply uh, when we carry on uh, the study. Um, however, if it is unclear which objective is desired, uh, so, okay, so, so this is what I just said. Sorry, it's... Um, however, if we want a uh, simpler off-the-shelf procedure, then uh, this analysis shows that actually Homo's procedure is quite uh, reasonable in terms of all these four uh, object uh, power objectives. Homo is not bad, whereas uh, close to for if indeed exactly one of the subgroups uh, uh, is um, not null, then uh, close to for is it doesn't do well at all. Okay. Um, um, uh, how, how much time do you still have? I'm sorry. Um, uh, maybe five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, I'll just... A, mi a minute or two, yeah. What? Uh, sorry, a minute or two, yeah. A minute or two, okay. So, so I, I, won't, I won't go into this. I'll skip this. Uh, so uh, one comment is that the optimal weekly monotone OMT policy, what I described was a complete solution for the marginal nominal alpha procedure where we require that uh, we will only reject if the p-value is less than alpha. If instead we just require weak, weak monotonicity, then uh, also we arrive to the same uh, policy for the normal means problem. Without an ad, uh, without this added restriction, actually the OMT policy may be harder to find. Uh, with the our works that do it uh, by ourselves as well as uh, uh, previous works, uh, previous work by Rosenblum uh, et al. Uh, now, but if we have, we don't use this additional restriction of weak monotonicity, uh, then uh, we may actually receive procedures that are arguably unattractive. So for example, there is actually a paper by Rosenblum who uh, shows that if we want to optimize for pi any, the optimal procedure is to do uh, the, to test the global null using uh, the Stufer uh, combining method. And if, if we reject the global null at level alpha, then uh, we will declare uh, the smallest, um, the hypothesis with the smallest p-value uh, as uh, non-null. This is the policy. 
Now, why is that uh, possibly unattractive? So for example, uh, if uh, the p-values say are 0.02 and 0.03, then uh, we will only we will reject the first hypothesis. However, if the p-values are 0.002 and 0.001, then we will only reject the second hypothesis. So it really violates the weak monotonicity, which is sort of an intuitive one that, that we would want. I mean, we have evidence here that uh, the first, uh, that we have here stronger in the blue, we have stronger evidence that, that uh, uh, the first hypothesis is not known. Okay, so to summarize, uh, attaining high power while controlling TAC1 error is the primary criterion for designing good tests. This issue is critical with k equals to one, as well as with k greater than one. With k greater than one, this leads to challenging optimization problems. And for testing k equals two hypotheses, we, provi we provide OMT policies for strong family-wise error control. The, uh, the, these policies are useful for making design decisions in clinical trials with multiple primary and possibly also secondary outcomes. Uh, and this is, uh, we've been working for a while on uh, optimal multi te multi multiple testing. The first paper is the one that I've talked about today. Here are uh, several others. Uh, and uh, thanks, that's it. Thanks very much, Ruth, for a really interesting talk. And um, yeah, we're done very nicely from Frank's talk as well. So I think we have a question from the audience. Uh, BSM has raised their hand. Um, see if they do have a question. Okay, we will we'll come back. Uh, so I guess one one question I had was about the extension of these methods to more than two policies. Um, would I guess it, it would be very challenging? Um, but uh, do you have some I guess preliminary thoughts about how plausible or feasible that that would be once you start? Uh, yeah, we're we're actually working on this. So, yes, I think I think uh, we're in. In a good direction for for k close to three, uh, and uh, I don't know more than that. We'll see, <laughs> but uh, yes, it's uh, but but really it's uh, it's also uh, I mean the, the the philosophy I think it's instead of looking at uh, okay uh, we this is uh, the the we want a procedure that 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 works uh, like, like this uh, A, B, C, D. And what we are saying is that uh, let's define the, the objective, let's define the constraints, even if we have then a set of uh, uh, off-the-shelf procedures, uh, that then, then we can actually examine their power, power properties, even if it's not optimal, but it's approximately optimal, et cetera. It's just um, uh, put it, putting really uh, a clearly defined objective in mind when you design the studies, I think, I think it can be... Um, a useful, useful approach, and then of course, if uh, you have a challenging optimal uh, optimization problem that you solve, then it's lovely. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I was, I was thinking also about the objective criterion once you start moving from two to more, yeah, than many complex. Different. Yeah, but I think the maximum actually objective is really attractive. So you have a minimal effect that you want. Uh, it's really, I mean, at least for one parameter exponential families uh, to say that it instead of just, uh, you know, it's it's a whole range. It's just not, it's not just a single objective. So it is actually more practically useful in that sense. Mm, that's a good point. Great. Thank you very much, Ruth. We, we're out of time. Uh, so we'll move on to the speaker. Thank you for a really nice talk. So our final speaker for this session is Adit Randas, who is a 10-year track assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. His current research themes include high-dimensional multiple testing, safe anytime valid sequential inference, distribution-free uncertainty quantification, and machine learning for hypothesis testing. Uh, so today he'll be talking about interactive multiple testing. Uh, Adit, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, David. And uh, it's been fun to see all of the amazing talks before mine. Uh, mine will be rather different from the previous two talks in, in this session. And, um, and hopefully it will point towards some interesting directions for, for future research. So I would say this is you know, an area that's been 
alive and well for the last three or four years only, but there's plenty of interesting problems for the future. Okay, so interactive algorithms. Now, you know, these are motivated by, you know, this question that nature posed to, you know, over a thousand, uh, a couple of thousand uh, scientists in, in, in which they asked, is there a reproducibility crisis? And these are from a variety of different uh, fields. And um, as you can see, the vast majority felt that there, there was actually a reproducibility crisis in, in their subfield. And my opinion is that one major issue is actually research of degrees of freedom. Um, so data scientists, they want to interact with their data. They want to use their intuition, their priors. They want to exploit the structure in the data. But many classical statistical methods were not built to handle this type of interactivity. So we use many informal terms like double dipping to uh, describe this. But formally, there's a selection bias that occurs if you, you know, if you peek too much at the data while you know, exploring it and trying to make confirmatory um, inferences at the same time. So there's a need for somehow principled statistical methods that can work in these kind of sequential interactive settings, and and this talk will 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 describe some uh, you know a line of research that has proceeded with with this aim in mind and you know with partial success. So classical testing is like a unidirectional pipeline. You're you're first supposed to choose your your test, then you you know you you know not supposed to you know choose the test based on the data. So then technically you collect the data and the side information and whatever later on. You come up with your conclusion, but often what happens is you might think, oh, well, you know, the conclusion wasn't what I really wanted. Perhaps I should use some other model, some other method, some other test statistic. Maybe you look at the conclusion again, but obviously in, in, if you do, if you did this, the conclusion is not reproducible. And, and, you know, test statistics cannot be altered after observing the data. You can't change your mind and go back and do something else. So, you know, a hypothetical data scientist wish list looks like they, they want to use their prior knowledge and intuition. They want to incorporate structure in the form of soft or hard constraints. They want to interactively explore, you know, have a human in the loop of the analysis, uh, employ flexible probabilistic modeling tools, and at the same time be robust to unknown dependent structures in the data. And, uh, you know, you, you want all of these things, but of course the challenge is doing this while having somehow correct statistical inference. And this talk will be about some progress within multiple testing to accomplish, well, at least, you know, four of these goals and the fifth one we'll see. So interactive testing basically allows loops. So, you know, in some sense you collect your data, but you don't uh, reveal all of the data to the data analyst or to the scientist. You mask the data initially, and this I'll describe what this masking means. Um, and so the, the scientist sees the masked data, and then there's an interactive test, which is a multi-step procedure where you know you you make some proposal. If you know if it's not rejected, you can unmask some of the data, and you can think about what you're doing, and you can you know this will happen in many rounds. Uh, and, and, you know, in the end, you, you, you have your uh, conclusion and, and we'll see how to design such tests such that they actually still are valid despite this uh, interactivity. Okay, so the test can essentially be customized or revised after observing the data, uh, but not the full data, but only the mass data. And we'll see that you, the mass data often contains lots of information uh, to allow us to, to design powerful tests of this style. Okay, so just to set up some basic notation, we have we're in we are in the multiple testing setting. There's multiple hypotheses. Some are true nulls, some are non nulls. Uh, we have a procedure that uh, makes some discoveries, which are just the set of rejected nulls. Some of them are are actually truly nulls. Some are non null. Uh, some the ones that are null that we rejected are the false discoveries. The false discovery proportion is the ratio of v to r. In this case, two out of the four discoveries are false, so the false discovery proportion is a half. False discovery rate is the expected value of the false discovery proportion. There's many notions of power, but you know, one example would be how many of the true nulls that we could have found, how many did we actually find? Okay, so we desire procedures that have low FDR and high power. Okay, so uh, that's, that's pretty much the same as everything else in the session. This was just for notation. So interactive multiple testing, here's a, like a rough timeline of how things have proceeded. It started out with uh, a JRSS paper by uh, Lihua Lei and Will Fithian. They conceptualized this you know, idea of masking and they designed uh, what's, the, what's called the ADAPT algorithm. Uh, this is interactive FDR control. Um, uh, as a funny story, uh, you know, the, the day they put their paper up on archive, I read it immediately. I you know, immediately came up with an idea for extending it. And that eventually resulted in a Biometrica paper that was published this year, but was on archive for several years. 
Um, and, and this was called the star algorithm also for FDR control. It enforces structure, uh, structural constraints if you want to, and it generalized this idea of uh, masking in several ways. Um, after that, uh, you know, I uh, took on a PhD student, Boyan Duan, she just graduated recently. She's currently at Google, but her thesis was on advances in interactive inference. And, and so we extended this from uh, interactive FDR control tests, which were the previous two works to interactive global null testing. Um, interactive family-wise error rate control, where we, we showed how to handle conservative nulls with better and more flexible masking tools. Um, and then we moved to more causal inference setup. So an interactive rank tests, which are often used in, uh, in causal inference, so Wilcoxon and Friedman uh, style uh, tests. Um, and uh, lastly, you know, an FDR control setup again, but in a fully causal inference setup, um, this moves entirely away from, uh, from p-values. Uh, and, uh, and, and and more recently, there was again Li Hua and Will have continued to work on the topic with other collaborators, uh, Yang and Ho, and they have a bonus algorithm for multivariate settings. So the first few have been published in you know, some kind of statistics journals and machine learning conferences. The last few are on archive. So as you can see, this is a very fresh and young area, and I'll try to describe some of the central ideas in this area. I'll describe two works, the star one, uh, which was at Biometrica, and one, one which is an archive, the causal inference one. So you get a flavor of how to do masking when you have p-values and then how to do what masking means when you don't even have p-values. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each. Okay, so the rest of this talk is just about two things, star, which is for both for FDR control, but one with p-values, one without. Okay, so for the first part of this talk, uh, each hypothesis will have some associated side information in the form of covariates or features. And the assumption that we will make, which is strong to start and hopefully people will be able to relax it in the future, is that the null p-values are conditionally independent of each other and of the non-nulls given, the, given these covariates. And we will return to this assumption in the, in the simulations. Okay, so essentially what we will be able to achieve is, uh, well, four of these, like we will be able to use prior knowledge and intuition, incorporate structure, interactively explore, uh, employ flexible probabilistic modeling tools. And the last one, it's like empirically, it seems to be robust to dependence, but, but, uh, but mathematically, we don't know yet. Okay, and so STAR essentially combines ideas from several other uh, methods in the multiple testing literature. If you've heard of knockoffs or accumulation tests or ADAPT, combines a few of them. I won't assume you know any of these, so I'll just present it from scratch. Okay, so before I present the final algorithm to you, the, the final algorithm will seem like, wow, where did you come up with that? Um, uh, so I'll, I'll give you first three pieces of intuition that help build up to the final algorithm. So the first intuition is that masking the p-values enables exploration while avoiding selection bias. So I'll tell you now what masking means by giving you one example of masking. We have many more in the paper, but this is a simple one for a talk. So masking is uh, uh, an example of data carving where you take the p-value and you split it into two parts. Uh, the first part, the one on the left, I'm gonna call the masked p-value. So that's just the minimum of p-i and one minus p-i. Um, and I'm gonna denote that as g of p-i. Um, you can think about like reflecting it above uh, one half. So if you know that the masked p-value is 0.3, you're basically confused, is it 0.3 or 0.7? That's what you don't know. Uh, and the other piece, um, H of PI is, I'm going to call that a missing bit because it's actually just one bit of information is, is the p-value larger than a half or not? Okay, and the times two is just for making its expected value equal to one. Um, so you have these two pieces and the key part is that we're going to use most of the information, which is the masked p-value for selection. And we'll use the remaining missing bit, we'll use that for inference. Okay, and uh, the reason that this is all going to work is that for null p-values, these two pieces are independent of each other. Just think for a moment about a uniform p-value. If you are confused between 0.3 and 0.7, like if the masked p-value is 0.3, then you know essentially you have no information. You, you are equally likely, the missing bit is equally likely to be zero or, or two, um, and, and you have no information at all. So for, for, for nulls, uh, you should think about for uniforms, um, these two are actually independent. We don't actually need this independence. What we actually need is that, the expected value of H given G is, um, is at least one, which actually also holds for conservative p-value. So you don't actually need it to be um, uh, uniform. That's just for intuition. Okay, so here's what happens when I reveal mask p-value. So this is the underlying ground truth. So what I have over here is 400 hypotheses. They're arranged into a 20 by 20 grid. The grid is the covariate information. That's the extra side information that you have. Every hypothesis is now also has which 
x y coordinate is it so like you know it's in the third row and fifth column okay that's that's a hypothesis so now there's some extra structural information that you have so now i'm going to draw a gaussian with mean 0 for the pink pixels and mean 2 for the red pixels and i'll convert that gaussian to a you know to a p value using the standard gaussian cdf transform okay so now i have p values one for every location 400 hypotheses 400 p values but the scientist doesn't see these what initially the scientist sees masked p values and so this is what the masked p values look like as you can see visually immediately um, these are numbers only between 0 and 0 0.5 but there's already a lot of information in the mass p values dark blue basically means it's very small light blue means it's it's closer to 0.5 dark blue is closer to zero light blue is closer to 0.5 so now that you know you reveal these you know masked p values so the scientist the scientist can look at this all of this information and say hmm you know what i think this is where the non nulls are so they can choose you know some region let's say this is a baby's part of the procedure this is not the whole procedure um, but they let's say they pick this region in yellow um, that's their proposed set um, then we can use the missing bit that we have not utilized so far to estimate the fall to you know, to form an estimate of the false discovery proportion for this set so all that we do is we add the missing bit um, as uh, in the numerator and divide by the size of the set in the denominator the false discovery proportion usually has a number of false discoveries in the numerator and so you can think about this the 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 sum of h of pi as being a proxy for the number of false discoveries and intuitively the reason why it's a good proxy is that non nulls you think they'll be small p values so they will not count towards this sum and um, uh, nulls will count half the time so essentially half the nulls will be less than a half half the nulls will be greater than a half but whenever they're greater than a half i count them twice because of the value of two so essentially the numerator is counting the number of nulls in this set and the denominator is just the size of the set so that's a reasonable proxy for fdp hat okay so that's the first intuition is that we use the mass p values for selection we use the h of pi the missing bit for for inferential statements okay this is not the final procedure yet this is just intuition the second piece of intuition is that masking permits the free use of models, even if the assumed models are incorrect. Okay, so let me give you an example of that. Now, you as a scientist, suppose you see this kind of a procedure, you might say, hey, you know what, I think that the non-nulls are a contiguous region. I expect them to be a contiguous region. So maybe you can assume a probabilistic model and, uh, and impute the missing bit. Remember that there's one missing bit in every location. That's the only thing that you don't know, whether it's less than or greater than a half. But you might assume that this missing bit should be smooth in some sense. And essentially, you know, use a kind of an EM algorithm based on a model to smooth out the thing on the left. Okay, and so I'm not going to describe the exact process of smoothing, but you know, anytime you have missing values, missing information, EM style algorithms along with the model can help impute those missing bits. And so what you get essentially is a smoothed out version with, of the thing on the left. It's not perfect, it's fine. And then you can base, the scientist can base the selected set based on the smooth model. But now remember the selection is still based only on the masked P values as well as some assumed model, which may or may not be correct, but I still have not touched the missing bits. So for this set, I can still estimate the false discovery proportion um, uh, using those missing bits. Okay, so now I've, I've been able to use a model now to smooth things out to help me, but my inference is still fine. Now, the third piece of intuition is that progressive unmasking. Now, you know, what I've presented so far seems like a one-step procedure. You know, the scientist chooses a set and then I tell you it's estimated FDP. But now we're going to make it a, an interactive procedure where there'll be progressive unmasking and uh, that, that yields some additional power. Okay, so what I've told you so far is that the intuition behind such an FDP hack is that the H and G are independent for the nulls, or at least actually in the paper we'll show there we only need certain mean independence or weaker condition, but intuitively this is fine for now. But another important piece of you know kind of obvious when you look at the formula for FDP hat is that F, the, the FDP and FDP hat, they are actually independent of all the P values that are outside of the rejection region. Like the numerator and the denominator only depend on things inside the rejection region. Everything outside doesn't matter. So essentially what we're going to do is we can exploit this, the fact that things outside the rejection region are, are independent of FTP or FTP hat. So after you make a selection, we can reveal to you all of the unrejected p-values. So you make a selection, we reveal everything else to you. Using the new information, you can contract that selected set. You cannot expand it because you know now the things outside the set, but you can contract that selected set. 
and we, when you recurs on this you uh, you basically obtain the star algorithm so you can progressively shrink the set learning newer and newer information as you do so and at some point we will stop okay so now now we have the three pieces of information in there that i can actually present the final star the actual algorithm to you and then i'll show you videos of how it works okay so the we start off by saying that the scientist chooses the target fdr level alpha some constraints that they might have in their mind uh some covariates for each hypothesis so we initially say that the initial rejected set is everything okay the, the scientists would like to reject every hypothesis it's not going to be possible so they're going to have to shrink their rejected set but that's how the procedure starts and uh, you know we reveal the information certain amount of information to the scientists what do they know they know all the covariates they know all the masked p values and the missing bits they know the sum of the missing bits you know so that they they actually know some information about them they know how many ones and zeros there are um you know in in the overall set okay so that's the first step that's initialization now this procedure will stop and reject the the teeth set rt if two things happen firstly the rejection set satisfies certain constraints that you have and your estimated fdp is less than alpha and now the estimated fdp is basically what i told you before except you have this 2 plus and 1 plus there and that's needed for the theory to go through for finite sample actual fdr control but intuitively it's exactly what i told you before okay so we'll stop as soon as this fdp hat is less than alpha we will end but if it's not yet less than alpha then you are freely the scientist is allowed to freely shrink the set um, to any other smaller set um uh, in a predictable fashion knowing only the information available to them so far uh, and they actually allowed to update their constraints as well if they started out with some constraints of what they think the rejection set should look like they can update their constraints i mean the constraints are entirely optional they could be soft or hard constraints and they can be updated as the procedure goes along and then the new information this is a filtration the new information available is the stuff in blue which is all the p values not in rt these are revealed to you so the scientist gains information as they go along they know all of the p values outside of rt and inside rt they know the masked p values which is already a lot of information okay so that's what the procedure look like and you know you repeat it step 3 after step 3 you go back to step 2 and you check can you stop if is the fdp hat small enough if it's not then you shrink further and so on okay and here's the step at which there's a there can be a human in the loop choosing how to shrink these sets based on prior knowledge intuition models things of that kind or you know if this is too painful for the human that's fine you can have an automated procedure acting on the human's behalf that somehow automates the intuition of the human so here's the main theorem as i said we need this independence assumption we assume that the null p values are independent of each other and of the non nulls and that each null p value actually has a non decreasing density on 0 1 we actually need something a little bit lighter than that but this is the easiest assumption to state in a talk then star controls fdr at level alpha there's no other assumption any kind of exploration can happen any kind of structure any kind of covariates um uh, you know star controls fdr at level alpha so what do i mean by that if these kappa t's are predictable constraints which means i update them based on the information so far and i define tau as the stopping time which is the first time at which my rejection set satisfies my constraints and my estimated fdp is less than alpha that's the stopping time then the expected value of the fdp of my rejection set at the stopping time that's at most alpha that's what i mean by star controls fdr at level alpha okay so a uh, pretty clean theorem statement uh, the proof i won't present it's based on certain martingale techniques so here's an uh, here's a you know a video of how this is running in practice so on the left i showed you that's the actual ground truth which of course you know we don't know in real life on the right is what the scientist really knows this is the initially masked p values and in the middle is the star algorithm uh shrinking the rejection set so the dark red is the current proposed rejection set and on the top you can see the estimated fdp hat so fdp hat is 0.64 so you know that's too large so it still has to shrink the set then it chooses kind of based on the masked p values which are revealed and based on the revealed p values outside of the dark red region it decides how to shrink the set so of course we are now running an automated algorithm for the purposes of these simulations um and we, uh, we the automated algorithm of course doesn't know the ground truth it just knows it's searching for a contiguous region um of non nulls okay so um and 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 what you can see as you know the number of as the size of the rejection set changes the fdp hat is actually decreasing but it doesn't have to strictly decrease but it's generally decreasing and now we're getting to the point that i think over here we said alpha is 0.2 let's say or something of that kind and we're getting to the region where um it will eventually fall below alpha and it will stop 
Okay, so um, and, and, and in the lower figure, it's just a video uh, instead of using the original master p values. If you use some kind of smooth master p values, that's also fine. The theorem still holds, and and it's finding a pretty sensible region. So we, you know, here's three different examples. If you just ran Benjamin Hochberg on them, just said, okay, look, I have 400 hypotheses. I have p values from all of them. Run Benjamin Hochberg. That's what it finds, and that's natural because Benjamin Hochberg is not using any covariate information. It's just treating all of the hypotheses as being exchangeable, and so that's what it finds. In contrast, star in three. This is an automated algorithm that's just trying to find a contiguous region. That's the constraints that it's keeping in mind. But other than that, you know, it's it's fully automated, and it finds pretty sensible answers. So you know, reasonably powerful procedure. Now let's get back quickly to the issue of uh, of uh, um, uh, dependence. So we ran uh, on the first row. I'm showing you the FDR against the target the achieved FDR against the target FDR under independence, and I'm changing it to positive dependence and negative dependence. And what we find is that um, you know the star procedure actually empirically does not get affected really much by dependence. It's uh, target and achieved FDR are pretty much identical. The adapt procedure actually becomes anti-conservative under uh, positive dependence the bh procedure becomes conservative under positive dependence but star remains somewhat neutral uh, and under negative dependence they all seem fine uh, we seem a similar thing this is in terms of power um, the blue line is bh so star obviously has better power um, uh, than yeah, under independence but under positive or negative dependence again the power of star is, doesn't seem to be affected that much the power of adapt is hurt by dependence a little bit but star seems to be relatively more stable against dependence so in the paper, we have other applications. Like, you know, the reason I chose this structure was simply for visualization, but any structure really works. So if you have pre-structured hypotheses, directed acyclic graphs of hypotheses, something called bump hunting, um, if you want to do knockoffs with structured covariates. So we explore a bunch of other applications in the paper, which I will, you know, leave you if you're interested to, to, to check out further. Okay, so that's the first part. And that's how you enable interaction with p-values. Um, I want to give you a glimpse into a causal inference application. So the, for the second part, uh, we're going to move away from p-values completely. Instead, we're going to assume that each person this is a causal inference setup. Each person or hypothesis is going to, is going to have an associated hypothesis. Again, they'll have some side information in form of features, uh, and we're going to be in a randomized experiment. So each person is assigned treatment or control at random, and their corresponding potential outcome is observed. If you're familiar with the name and group in potential outcomes framework. Okay, so... Uh, I think it's best visualized with an example. So here again, I have a, a few hundred people. And um, so each of these boxes you should think of as a person. And um, I have two covariates, let's say. And let's say these covariates are in the range of zero to one. They could be age or body weight appropriately normalized or something like that. Now, um, I'm going to assign each person ID Bernoulli half treatment. Okay, so I'm going to assign at random some of them to control and some of them to treatment. And that's what you're seeing on the left. On the left plot, the people in purple were treatment, the people in orange were control. Okay, so that's that's what's happening on the left. Now, in the potential outcomes framework, we think of each person as having two potential outcomes. What is their outcome under control and what is the outcome under treatment? Um, and we don't observe both. We only observe one of them. Okay, if they were treated, we observe the treated potential outcome. Otherwise, we observe the the control potential outcome. And this are, these are the observed outcomes. On the right are the observed outcomes. Okay, so you can see there's a larger outcome towards the top right corner, there's a smaller outcome down left. So now the question I'm going to ask you is, this is the data that you actually observe. Now a question for all of you to think is, which of these subjects actually has a positive treatment effect? Okay, you have a few hundred subjects here, which people have positive treatment effect? This is individual level inference. Okay, this seems almost like it should seem actually quite difficult to answer because for each person, you either observe their treatment or their control outcome. But the question I'm asking is which people in this set have treatment greater than control? Their potential outcome of treatment is strictly greater than control. Well, I only observe one or the other. So how should I be able to make uh, an inference about individuals with this type of information? So typically you cannot, but we'll see through a hypothesis testing lens, multiple testing lens, we will be able to. Okay, so David, since I started, uh, around four minutes late. I'm hoping I can also end, you know, four minutes late. Um, so, you know, while, you know, I'll, I'll let you think about this a little bit uh, and guess, I'll just show you the right answer. The right answer is the people in the middle 
in because this was a simulation this is what we set it to be the people in the middle are the ones with the positive treatment effect and the people outside actually have no treatment effect now that seems hard to gauge you know if you if you looked at the right plot which is the observed outcomes it might you might be tempted to say well uh, you know maybe the people in the corner have the uh, a high treatment effect so maybe you 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 know pick a box like the the blue one and say i think these people respond to treatment that's fine we can think of those as our rejected set r and in in which case the, the the set in red will be our false discoveries and so what we would like is to identify subjects with a positive effect but have some error control on the expected proportion of false identifications and so we can think of this like an fdr error metric we would like to minimize you know like the numerators the subjects for which i have rejected but actually their treatment um, uh, potential outcome is less than their control potential outcome which means they don't respond to treatment and the denominators all the people that i actually found okay and so we choose to formalize the problem of identifying individuals who respond to treatment using the language of hypothesis testing and specifically fdr control and um, essentially what we will see is that you can design a an interactive multiple testing procedure that identifies these individuals okay so um, you know very quickly the the formal definition of null hypothesis is a zero effect under the null uh, and a positive effect of stochastic dominance under the alternative um, and you can extend this to non positive effects and we assume that we really are in a randomized clinical trial these are you know standard assumptions in the literature okay and, and fdr is the actual uh, error metric and our algorithm is called i cubed it's the interactive identification of individual effects it identifies a set of subjects with fdr less than alpha probably and reasonably high power as well okay so in this actual setup the green is what our i cubed algorithm actually identifies which you can see is 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 pretty good there are a few false discoveries but that's actually pretty acceptable given that we actually know no other solution to this problem currently okay so i'll briefly run you through the de algorithmic description of i cubed and um, and again show you where the exploration comes from and the idea here of masking is that the explorer the scientist does not have access to the treatment assignment so the single bit of who was treated and who was control is left hidden with the oracle and the explorer actually has the observations and the covariates for everyone but they don't know who was treated and who was control okay and so the the procedure is actually pretty simple we let y hat be any estimator of the conditional mean the expected value of y given x um we compute the residuals which is how much can yi be explained by y hat this is the difference between yi and y hat the explorer lets they inform the oracle about these residuals the oracle computes a treatment effect uh, an estimate of the treatment effect delta hat and um and then divides the rejection set into two pieces um and to construct a particular estimate of the fdr um i'll just quickly skip uh, skip a slide to tell you the, the overall procedure this is what the estimate of the fdr look looks like which is those who are actually negative and divided by those who are actually positive so it's a, it's a simple ratio very much like the earlier ratio uh, i described um and you know if the fdr if the fdp hat is less than alpha we stop otherwise the explorer says pick a person and tell me what their treatment assignment is so they can pick a person currently in the set and ask the oracle to reveal their treatment assignment was that person treated or were they control okay and then the oracle says okay for the person you said i will reveal their their uh, assignment um and using that assignment the explorer can calculate and update their estimate of delta hat and they shrink their set okay so it's a, it's a it's a very simple procedure like before we start off with all subjects and we shrink it over time um and we learn these bits which are the treatment assignments over time but we keep many of the bits hidden and basically the theorem statement is that whenever we stop the fdr will actually be less than alpha okay so i'll just skip a couple of slides i'm not going to go through everything uh because i'm a little bit out of time uh but in experiments we do find it's extremely powerful in uh, and controls fdr as we actually uh, expect okay so let me quickly summarize uh there's some important advantages to having a human in the loop uh, interaction can be enabled by masking of p values arbitrary structural constraints on the rejection set that you would like to impose can be imposed and you can retain you can use flexible models including bayesian models but still retain frequentist guarantees it kind of meets uh, gets the best of both worlds 
Uh, in randomized experiments, you hide the treatment assignment. That's the form of masking. It enables the scientist and the algorithm to work together to, to, to make causal inferences. You can discover positive effects despite having an unobserved potential outcome uh, and still get non-asymptotic FDR control at the end. Okay, so with that, I'd like to stop and uh, encourage you to check out some of our other works uh, on this topic. I think it's a very interesting area for future directions. Thank you. Thank you, teacher. Thank you. A very nice talk. Very good intuition. Some nice videos as well. Uh, so we are a bit out of time. So I, I think what we'll do is ask one question and we'll defer further discussion for the uh, panel discussion shortly. Um, so I guess my question was around the number of hypotheses which these uh, algorithms or proposals work well. Um, so in the examples you, you gave you know, 20 by 20 grid of 400 policies, um, how about if we say looked at the very small setting of the handful of policies? Um, yeah, I was just wondering where, where the kind of limitations are in terms of number of policies. That, that yeah, that's, that's a great question. My, uh, my philosophical feeling is when you have a small number of hypotheses, the FDR error metric itself doesn't make sense. So if I have five or 10 hypotheses and I'm making like three discoveries, I think the FDR error metric itself starts to lose its meaning a little bit. And I would rather go with something like family wise error rate. So uh, both since both parts of the talk focused on FDR control, um, I think of using it with at least a few hundred hypotheses as being a reasonable uh, range to be using it. But, but I think um, we do have a family wise error rate version of the interactive procedure that can work with small numbers of hypotheses as well in the tens, I would say. Uh, but since we're using this kind of a masking technique I think it, it actually can't get too small. You, I don't think under 10 would actually be powerful. Thank you. Um, so actually we do, we do have one quick question from Florian. So uh, he asked, how would I3 look with a treatment that's, that does not work for anyone? And is there an advantage to conditioning on an overall decision, i.e. that the treatment works at least for someone? Um, yeah, so the great question. There's no problem. If the treatment doesn't work for anyone, FDR control uh, implies basically global null control. So like you will not reject anyone with high probability um, that it'll just return the empty set if the treatment doesn't work for anyone. Um, uh, and now conditioning on an overall decision, I don't know how to do it so far. So currently, I don't know how to do a two-step thing where you first run some kind of a global null test and then do something like I cubed and condition on that global null test rejecting. I, I don't know yet how to um, control the FDR in that kind of a conditional setup, but that's an interesting question for sure. Thank you very much, Aditya, and thank you to all our speakers for this session. So what we'll now do is uh, take a comfort break before we start a panel of discussion. Uh, in the meantime, if people have questions that they would like to ask in the Q&A, then feel free to type those. Uh, but what we'll also do for the panel discussion is if people want to raise their hand, uh, then uh, we can unmute uh, you and you can ask your question um, verbally as well. So yeah, just three minute comfort break. We'll reconvene at 25 past uh, for our panel discussion with our three panelists.
Okay, let's uh, reconvene for the panel discussion. Frank, are you right there? Hello. Okay, so um, yes, if people have questions, they can put them in the Q and A. So what we're going to do is um, have some general discussion about multiple testing. So I have some starter questions and let's hopefully people can also ask their questions either in the Q&A or by raising their hand if they'd like to. So to start with, thought, just ask how each one of you first got interested in multiple hypothesis testing problems. Uh, so maybe if we start with Okay, yeah, my answer is pretty simple, actually. My current wife uh, was a PhD student in the department with me, and uh, she does uh, neuroscience. Um, so she does brain neuroscience, scans, uh, you know, people as they're doing language studies uh, in the fMRI scanner, and then tries to, you know, make influence about which parts of the brain are processing, which types of language and so on. And multiple testing problems naturally arise over there because um, let's say you have 30,000 or 50,000 boxes in the brain and you're trying to correlate activity with some features of the stimulus. Um, and uh, so multiple testing arises, but so does issues of dependence because um, nearby areas of the brain have you know similar kind of noise patterns. And so do issues of structure, which is we think that areas that respond to, let's say, syntax of a sentence are not likely to be you know, scattered all over the brain, they're likely to be contiguous regions of the brain. So um, in, I, had no, I had no introduction to multiple testing before my just conversations, uh, informal conversations uh, with her. And, and I found the problem very interesting. And you know, she was just applying the benchmark Hawkwood procedure back then, maybe eight years ago. And so I, was, I, I said, well, there must be a way to take uh, this structure and prior knowledge and intuition and so on into, into account. And, and so that's, that's what got my um, interest going. And my first paper was very much motivated by trying to address that problem. So that, that's my story. Oh, no, that's very interesting. And, and have you published a paper with your wife on? Oh yeah, published several papers with her and uh, yeah, that eventually uh, led us to getting married. Now I have an endless source of uh, data and problems uh, right next to me. So, well, there you go. Multiple testing has, has uses outside of uh, academia and be to romance. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Deetja. Uh, how about you, Ruth? Well, uh, my advisor, uh, my PhD advisor was Yav Benjamini, so it was pretty natural to to start with problems in multiple testing. And actually, around the time that I was interested in working with him, uh, somebody contacted him from the um, uh, from the psychology department that does fMRI uh, studies. So what started it was the fact that uh, you have different. Um, uh, different experiments uh, where you give different incentives over time, and then uh, what they wanted is to know that uh, the, the regions in the brain, they actually um, uh, they are activated um, under the first condition and the second condition and the third condition uh, versus uh, not, not just uh, any activation, but at least two or three, and that started the whole partial conjunction thing and replicability, and this is these were my first works uh, in, in this film, yeah. But uh, no, my, my husband wasn't around then. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, and you, Frank? Uh, yeah, it's also to the PhD advice, I guess. Um, so my wife is clinician, but I don't think she cares about multiplicity. Um, it's really my PhD advisor. Um, although all my problems tend to be very low dimensional. So I'm happy if I have three or four hypotheses to test. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm impressed about this sheer number of uh, large scale problems that I'm seeing here and the large number of hypotheses. Um, yeah, but my PhD was at the Department of Horticulture. Um, so evaluating, designing, evaluating field experiments, and these tend to be very low, low dimensional. Interesting. 
So yeah, so that, that was interesting to see how you got into the field in the first place. Uh, so my next question is, um, I guess, firstly addressed to Dietje, but uh, Ruth Frank, feel free to chip in as well. So, so nowadays there seems to be a continuously growing number of different type one error rates, so Banrow's error rate or discovery rate or discovery exceedance, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what message would you have for the non-specialist user around choosing type one error rates in practice? Yeah, I think that's an excellent uh, question. Um, my advice to non-specialist user would be to try to understand the error metrics. It's really uh, to specialize themselves a little bit. I think we, we too much these days, we want statistics and machine learning to just be black boxes that we just get a software, download, throw it at the data and it spits out an answer. And, and I think like that's just not possible. And I don't think that's the right attitude towards data analysis and, and science. Um, I think different applications just need different error metrics. It's like saying in machine learning, is there one loss function that I can just use for all my problems? That would be nice, but that's unrealistic. And, uh, and I think it's the same with uh, almost any other um, uh, area of application is that different uh, subgroups of people just need, they need it for different purposes and different error metrics just make more sense in different settings. And so I don't think we will ever converge to, you know, we don't have to have 28 error metrics, but I don't think we'll converge to two. Uh, I mean, maybe having, I think there are about four or five now that, you know, that, that are common and keep coming up. And, and uh, I think if, if scientists or users can figure out what the, what the differences are intuitively and mathematically between these, it will, it will help them choose the right procedure. And I don't know if there's any way around that. Yeah, that those are good points. Um, do Frank, um, any thoughts from, from your end or, or perhaps in the context of clinical trials, are we kind of stuck with family wise error rate um, for, for foreseeable future? Well, just in, in large scale problems, uh, it arrives to actually estimating the false discovery proportion, which is maybe what we're all uh, really want to get into. I mean, we don't care about the FDR, which is the expectation of the false discovery proportion. We want it. And uh, actually, uh, things that uh, uh, previous talks have alluded to, as well as Aditya and, and others uh, before that, uh, is actually coming up with bounds on the FTP. That may be a really attractive uh, way of uh, going forward uh, when, when it's possible. Um, yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed um, hearing the specific comments for Wood and I think uh, you, you also mentioned at the beginning of your slides that maybe um, a false discovery proportion would be of higher interest and in looking at expectation. Um, yeah, internally, I think it, you know, FDR is being perceived as a black box, um, you know, error measure, measure whenever we have, I don't know, um, high dimensional problem, we just use FDR without thinking twice what it really means. Um, so I'm glad to hear from the experts that false discovery proportion is something we should or could at least consider using. Um, that's already good. Uh, maybe I can quote the two of you in my future internal discussions. Um, yeah, as with respect to the family wise error rate, um, I think, I mean, there are probably good reasons why we are using it. Um, in, in our clinical trials, I mean, um, we all used to it. We know what it can and what it cannot do and what it provides, right? Um, so, but obviously you, you have seen my, my, my thoughts about its limitations. So maybe maybe there are some opportunities to move beyond family wise air weight in certain types of applications. That'd be, that'd be to see how it develops in the future. So we'll have a, a question from the audience members. So DSM asks, the field of uh, MCP multiple comparative procedures is highly connected to the field of multivariate analysis and dependence, and especially spatial dependence. How do you see the field of MCP moving towards this problem? So I can start, like, I, I think I fully agree with, uh, with the comment. And I think there've been several uh, researchers in the online seminar for selective inference, like Armin Schwartzman, whose talks explicitly try to, uh, you know, model this kind of spatial dependence and account for it. And, um, and I think that that will only increase over time. I think the, um, it's just hard. I think the reason that you don't see more of it right now is I think the, the math is hard to actually make it work correctly, both in theory and in practice, but I do see uh, increasing uh, interaction between them and also with finance. So it turns out that financial instruments, because they are, you know, dependent in complex ways. Um, in the 1980s, actually some of the tools that we use in p-values actually 
uh, stem from risk management uh, in finance. Ruschendorf has a famous book in the 1980s, which from which we we uh, have many tools about how to combine p values in dependent settings. And and so I think there's still more tools that have been developed more recently in the finance literature that will come to use in multiple testing. But again, it requires people to kind of learn two different literatures. So uh, yeah, I guess progress is a little bit slow. Okay. Um, Nothing to add from my side. I think you said it all. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing is that dependence is a real issue. I mean, especially when it's a high dimensional, assuming that uh, uh, the p values are independent or the test statistics are independent, that doesn't work. So you do need to, to go around this uh, and make sure that that's you, the, the procedures are useful anyway even if the guarantees are not. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think my next question is around, uh, I guess, the Bayesian view of multiple testing. So uh, I think Barry and Hochberg back in 1999, they said, uh, and I quote, in the simplest Bayesian view, there is no need for adjustments, and the Bayesian perspective is similar to that of the frequentist who makes inferences on a per comparison basis. Uh, so, so I guess my kind of general question is, uh, would you agree that from a kind of Bayesian perspective, everything is fine and we don't need to worry about multiple testing? I don't agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, there is selection going on, and then you need to, I mean, even if a Bayesian approach, you need a prior. Uh, there are consequences to the decisions that you're making, and uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a differentiation between, or distinction between multiple testing and multiplicity. Um, Maybe that they don't test hypothesis um, in a fully Bayesian world, but I think multiplicity as a consequence of a selection bias, I think it still applies in Bayesian methods, I would think, but I'm not an expert, so. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with the perspective that Bayesians can wash away multiple testing. Uh, I think it, it stems from this feeling that Bayesians, because they they all of their inference is conditional on the data, um, so if you're conditional on the data already and you additionally condition on a selection event based on the data where well, you've already conditioned the data. So if that additional selection event plays, plays no real role. Um, I, I somehow, I, I, I understand the, the philosophical argument at a high level, but I actually don't see it panning out in, in, in practice. I don't think that um, if we just adopted a Bayesian approach that uh, somehow the false discoveries would be massively reduced in the sciences. Um, I, I think, um, there is meaning to a controlling a frequentist error metric, which does not depend on the choice of a prior and having two different scientists disagree on their priors and disagree on their discoveries and things like that. But I think Bayesian approaches, I think there's a middle ground, maybe with empirical based style approaches or in the interactive approaches where you can use Bayesian techniques to guide you, but you still want frequentist error control at the end. Um, uh, and I, I think the future might be somewhere in the middle rather than fully Bayesian, at least that's that's my perspective, but we don't have a Bayesian on this panel, so. Um. <laughs> that's, that's a good. Uh, so, so VSM has made a comment. This is Andrew Gelman's approach. If you ask other Bayesians like Jim Berger, they would not agree. Uh, so thanks VSM. So that actually brings me nicely to the next question, which is actually about Andrew Gelman's suggestions around instead of focusing on kind of conventional type one error rates, um, he's proposed looking at what he calls type S errors, errors of sign, um, or type M errors, errors of magnitude. Um, so I, I guess my, my question is, would you, would you agree that we should be focusing or could focus more on those errors rather than our conventional type one error rates? Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, I think people do already. So I, I agree, I agree with that perspective, and I think that um, Tuki actually pointed out very early on that 
um, that sometimes we don't care about uh, just rejecting an R. We want to know is it's positive or negative. We want we want to sign claim and things of that kind. So actually, Tuki proposed this kind of sign inference, and so I think it makes sense. And as well as the strength of the 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 magnitude of the effect. So there are actually error metrics like false sign rate and the false coverage rate that that I know I've worked on and and probably Ruth and Frank and others have also worked on. Now I, I think this is the gap between theory and practice. Like I think there are methods to control the false sign rate and the false coverage rate and so on, but it seems practitioners download an R package and apply the FDR control. So we're like, okay, I don't know. Like I mean, there there exist methods and we could use possibly more interface between the theory and the practice with software and with tutorials and things of that kind but uh, i mean and my work's not new and there's many works before mine that, that focus on fcr and fsr but um, but i think they're not popular in practice yet and partially that might be the inertia that fdr has with it with you know 80000 citations or whatever that you know that's like a you know a default in some areas and family wise it be a default in some other areas that it's hard to move away from without enough uh, um, motion. So I think the methods do exist, but the inspiration to use them doesn't. Uh, I think uh, some uh, typical uh, methods just control the, the sign, the false discovery rate, etc. I mean, the BH does. Uh, when you look at the, at the sign, it also controls it. So, so it happens automatically uh, with many uh, uh, reasonable procedures. So in that sense, it's not that bad. <laughs> we just, uh, the theoretical proofs have focused more on uh, the, the non-signed version. But, uh, yeah. so maybe Frank can tell us in, in, uh, in Novartis, is that right? Is the, do people care about the sign and the magnitude and you know, things of that kind? Are they, is that a natural follow-up question whenever you tell them I can reject this null? Yeah, I mean, if you look into treatment effects, obviously, because whenever, um, you know, you bring a market, uh, a drug to the market, then you will have package inserts or labeled, um, and then you will have to say something about the treatment effect. And, you know, if our competitor has a drug in a similar disease or in the same disease, but with, uh, you know, much better treatment effect, then we won't be happy. So, um, so this is something that comes after you have declared significance, so whether the drug works at all. Um, I'm not sure whether we would necessarily look, look into this um, type S errors um, from, from Andrew Gelman. I'm not sure about this. Um, it, it's essentially an estimation problem as part of your overall influence, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think in our community, we're also having like um, discussions uh, about the use and misuse of key values more broadly. Um, yeah, I, I think it's difficult to just move away from p-values because you still need as a community, um, clinical trial community, you need some decisions to be made. And, and ideally, we will have a framework that we can all agree on. I mean, regulators and patients and investigators, doctors, but also the companies. And um, yeah, I think some framework would be good to have. And whenever you have certain boundaries or thresholds to make decisions, um, I guess you run into similar type of problems as maybe P waves of delivering. Yeah. So, uh, so typically in uh, in clinical trials, do you run uh, follow up studies to estimate the the treatment effect, or do you yes. use the same data and condition on the family wise error? No, 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 no. It's a it's really a sequence of many trials, um, and typically takes like you know from the time that you um, patent a molecule, you discover a molecule, all the way until it gets on the market. It's like ten to fifteen years. Um, so you can imagine it's a sequence of many many trials, and even if it is marketed. Um, you still run what we call post-marketing trials to understand the effect in a different population, in a broader population, in the real world, and in your actual clinical trial population. So yeah, there were there many studies being conducted, and uh, yeah, and um, and also before it comes to marketing, we actually run two what we call phase three trials, like trials that serve the submissions for agencies, regulator agencies. So we need to demonstrate significance in both trials. So yeah, it's pretty tough to uh, get into false positives, I guess. Um, yeah. Interesting, thank you. So yeah, actually Frank, what Frank was saying brings me nicely to the, the next question, um, which is well, based on this, what Frank was saying. So in, in the past few years, there's been growing cause to abandon the entire concept of statistical significance, that is the use of p-values in the conventional dichotomous 
So that's my question for each of you is, what do you think this means for hypothesis testing going forward? Um, so maybe we'll, we'll start with uh, Frank, he already, already started. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add what you just said. Sorry that, that I anticipated that question, but uh, I thought I'd just chime in. So, so nothing more to add, but I would be interested to hear the other two, um, Wood and Aditya. What's the feeling currently in Novartis? Uh, is it, are you ignoring the noise from psychology or or are you like actually taking it seriously that maybe it should be a bang? Like, you know, what's the feeling there? Yeah, and it's not at Novartis, but in, in our community, right? It includes regulators and and, and so on. Um, and and you know, companies more general, uh, but we feel quite comfortable about um, understanding um, the value of p-values and the, how they're used. And I don't think anyone in our community feels like, oh, p is less than 0.05, it's significant. And and we get, you know, approval. And if p-values like just above, like 5.1%, 5, 5 okay, we, we stop developing the drug. It's not like this dichotomy at all. Um, and maybe, um, we believe that we understand better <laughs> how to use p-values and um, yeah so there's a bit of um, and a lot of discussion how we maybe should better understand you know communicate the results and, and maybe that like a p-value of two and a half percent doesn't mean that your effect is two and a, you know as twice as good as if p-value was five percent obviously um, but maybe we, we should better understand um, the magnitude of p-values and how it translates into into, into magnitude of treatment effects, right? Um, but as I said also before, we, we typically have to demonstrate um, significant results in two trials. Um, and, and that should help us, so to speak, to, to reduce the, you know, the reproducibility problem, so to speak. So there are not so many drugs that have to be taken out from the market after they have been approved because of efficacy or lack of efficacy. It's mostly then because of safety issues or something like that. But it's not that the F, it turns out that the drug doesn't work at all anymore after once it has been approved. So I think the system is, is quite reasonable in that sense. Uh, I, I probably sound a bit defensive now, but that's how our discussions are. <laughs> and I think that the problem is more uh, when you have a lot of hypothesis and then uh... In psychology, they think that uh, confidence intervals uh, will actually solve the problems, but they don't because they actually select uh, only few confidence intervals from the many that they consider. So they have a selection problem and they can't actually run away from it. They just don't address it properly. So, so I think it's there's a gap in understanding with people that, that use statistics uh, rather than experts uh, of statistics in uh, medicine, especially. I mean, it's in medicine, it's far less heard, right? It's more in the behavioral sciences, and, but it makes serious damage. <laughs> so you need to fight it somehow. It's dangerous. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Ruth that it's it's kind of, I, I think it's actually dangerous uh, rhetoric. Uh, for me, the uh, maybe one analogy would be that you say I, I was trying to build a house and uh, every time I needed a tool, I picked a hammer and I used the hammer for whatever I needed to do, I used the hammer. <laughs> And then my house broke down, so I'm, I'm just going to ban hammers. Like, hammers will never be used in the future. Right? Well, it's a tool, and if we can figure out what is the right purpose for using that tool and how to use it well, and while using other tools at the same time, it's, it's not that harmful. But of course, if we blindly use it for every purpose, it is harmful, and we shouldn't ban the hammer because it's not the right tool in every situation. And so it's uh, I, I find it a little bit ridiculous, and I agree fully that, that people don't understand that confidence intervals also suffer from selection bias. If you pick a subset of the confidence intervals, you're exaggerating the, the trick effect estimates and things of that kind and so you're not running away from the selection problem so uh, it's not the 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 enemy isn't the p-values like and uh, changing uh, from the confidence intervals doesn't solve the problem i think uh, one needs to examine more where the lack of reproducibility is coming from and i think it's coming from sometimes the p-values not being not being p-values i mean it, because of the incentives uh, because of the incentive structure involved, if you try many methods out and change the test statistic and things of that kind, what you end up with is just, it's not a p-value. Um, and uh, you could have any bar, whether it's uh, any threshold, it could be for a confidence interval, <laughs> the effect size needs to be at least this much. But if I have many ways to construct confidence intervals, which I typically do, um, then the finally constructed confidence interval will not be valid either. But maybe communicating to, you know, while teaching or to scientists that, that you're not allowed to constantly 
you know, change what you're doing in order to get what you want. That removes the validity of the P. The, the enemy isn't the p-value. It's just that the methods that we are currently using, which are double, triple, quadruple dipping the data to hack the p-value, result in invalidity of p-values. But that could be true for any any statistical procedure we replace that with is that once you provide incentives, people will figure out how to hack them. And uh, and maybe more education about that, that could lead to a lack of reproducibility is maybe more important than banning the thing that's being hacked currently. And there is actually also the fact that there are publicly available databases that are now. So it's not even a question of uh, you not using proper p-values, but you base it on studies that use the same data. And then from that, you thought, oh, I will actually do a different analysis, but it's actually observing the data, but it's not directly, but it's more um, because everything is available and multiple uh, researchers are using the same thing, then it leads to all kinds of um, interesting problems. <laughs> Absolutely. Reproducibility. I mean, really, replicability. I think is is the key to to actually don't not to stop with uh, a finding in one study, but to actually try to to reproduce it as well, and then then it's really more established. Yeah, I think this word education that you mentioned, I think it's very important, and and you know, uh, I, I think even statisticians are not always clear what a p value really means. So if if you have a study today and it's a p is equal to 0.05, and now I'm asking what's the probability to get a significant result um, in the next identical study. Um, I think many people would say, well, it's 90% or 80% or whatever the numbers they say coming from more from a power concept, but actually it's 50%, right? Um, and um, if, if you just replicate the same study. So, and I think, yeah, understanding the magnitude of PVs and what it tells you, um, yeah, I think that's, there's a lot of education that, that could be done. Uh, David, you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, perhaps if you stop sharing your video, your voice might be clearer. It's not better. So I think David had put it in the chat, right? In view, you, in your view, what are some of the important open questions around multiple hypothesis testing? I have to say, I was so impressed about the two presentations from, and, and then obviously also in the first session, I think there are so many open questions. I, I really learned a lot today. So um, it's difficult for me to list off all the open questions. Uh, that's very impressive, the whole workshop. Uh, yeah, what can I say? Uh, maybe I should I should listen to the academics who are driving research and open ideas. <laughs> so in in my in uh, in my biased view, uh, it's related to the previous uh, answer of identifying um, why there's a lack of reproducibility and explicitly trying to address those those issues. So one of them is interactivity, I think, which I think everyone does things multiple times. Nobody just looks at one answer and stops there. And then how can we correct for this? Maybe simultaneous error metrics is one way to go where, you know, with the simultaneous FTP control camp of the world, um, they're like, you can look at your data and I mean, you can, you can pick different subsets and you can report different subsets after picking the data. And, you know, so that, that allows some kind of interactivity. Um, uh, the, the stuff I presented is, is just, a, is a different avenue towards allowing interactivity, but somehow like the procedures are a bit too static. And, um, and I, and I think that users don't realize that maybe they're not allowed to do it more than once. So they try it once as a test and then basically, oh, no, 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 something's wrong. I didn't get what I wanted. Let me change something and do it again. And so if that's a cause, we need to address somehow that. Um, so it's like, uh, so I think that's one issue. Another one is collecting data sequentially. In, in, in psychology, they, they don't 
fix a data size in advance, sometimes you'll have 13 subjects and then eight more subjects and then four more subjects and, and so on. And then maybe understanding, you know, uh, what's the right way to be forming p-values in such a setting where you have adaptive stopping in place. Um, and uh, like, basically, I, I think, uh, I think those are the important problems in multiple testing um, because multiple testing is, is certainly at uh, is certainly at risk right now of being abandoned by entire subfields like psychology, and uh, and and I think many of us here are defenders. But in order to convince them that it's still useful, maybe we do need to address their issues. Tell them we we hear your issues of lack of reproducibility, and uh, we think the reason is not p values. It's this and this and this. And here are our proposals to address this. So uh, you know, I think I think those directions are particularly important involving a human in the loop whether it's in interacting with the data or collecting more data or something of that kind in you know using prior knowledge involving the human while doing multiple testing okay um i think we're almost out of time so i'd like to thank i think ruth might have some uh... oh sorry i, I, I uh, okay it's okay. I couldn't tell you what you actually said. Um, no, Ruth, do go ahead. No, I, I, mean, I, I don't have much else to add. Uh, it's just, uh, I mean, it's really, we have a lot of sources of information now uh, and, and taking a lot of covariates into account and whatever. I mean, it's really, it's amazing how much uh, more can be done actually uh, with all this uh, additional knowledge. I mean, it's all building up. And, and continues to, so to use it uh, usefully um, is uh, just uh, ongoing uh, challenges. I mean, we, we will keep having uh, more and more, I think, folks. That it, statisticians will always be needed in every field. And, so, uh, and especially with uh, n n some knowledge of multiple testing, I think it's important. I think that's a great place to finish. Um, so thank you. Again, at each of you, Frank, for your contributions for really interesting, provoking panel discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone who, who was attending, and also like thank you, thank you, David, for helping organize it. Well, I think you deserve. Yeah, thank it. you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, very I'd also like to thank uh, Alison, who is on the call, who was behind the scenes uh, doing all the admin and something up the course. So thank you, Alison. As well. So. Thank you and hope you all have a good rest of the day or evening depending on your time zone and hope to be in touch with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.